Uh, first off, we have a public hearing. In accordance with the Wetland Protection Act, the Amendment Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on a notice of intent application filed by Shea Engineering Circuit, representing the Sylvan Springs Realty Trust for a property located at 16 Locust Hill Drive, Mendon, Mass. The proposal is for the construction of a single family home associated septic activities, earthwork, and landscape. Public hearing will be held on above notice Thursday, October 21st at 7 p.m. Mr. Chairman, I'll make note that the meeting is 7 o'clock. Yeah, the hearing. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 7 o'clock. Okay, um, this is 16 Locust Hill Drive. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the site, uh, this is quite a ways into the subdivision, probably about 2,000 feet from Northbridge Street down over this hill drive. So we have a uh, pretty large lot that's over four acres in size. Uh, we're proposing a four bedroom single family house. And we have a approximately a 550-foot driveway to get from Locust Hill Drive to the house. I'm sorry, there's two sheets. One is the blow-up just of the house because the driveway is so long. Yes. And here has the big one first. Yeah, and this is a 40 scale. The other one is uh, a 20 scale. Okay. And it deals with the house area in more detail. What's uh, in the buffer zone? Just the, just the buffer driveway. zone is shaded on this plan is shaded red. See it? Yeah. And it's uh, you should be able to pick it out on that sheet. Yep. Basically where, the, where, basically where the, the hay bales are. Yeah, we have 600 feet of hay bales. The driveway, the house is about in the bottom. Right? The driveway is something. Part of the driveway is the house is actually outside just the way. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right there. Right there. Driveway, the driveway is inside the buffer, most of the way back. So, we have two things going on here in this strip. Here's the lot line between lot 62 and 63, right here. And here is the main water course that drains the hill towards Northbridge. That's what this this uh, green shading indicates. And you're grading right to the property line, right? <laughs> on on the uphill side. Yes. On the, yes. Yeah. Where there's not a lot of choice here. No. And part of what we're doing here is we're trying to coordinate the construction of this driveway with the construction of a water quality swell that runs the full length of the lot and actually conveys water over on the jewel crossing side of the property. So this is a major feature of our stormwater management. So you'll catch the water coming down the hill and then take it along the grade, letting it out gently. That's so it's right. Coming right down there. Exactly. And so we we catch all of this by wrapping this whole area with the swale. We catch everything that comes off of this lot. So this this lot will be pre-treated. Even in times of frozen or thick snow or melt, or the water always finds its place. It doesn't back up because of ice conditions or you know, uh, yeah. snow. You know, I don't know. Those well, you, differently you know, when you get to frozen ground if, if you're 100 percent frozen then you're going to have 100 percent runoff or thereabouts uh, your pre and post uh, it goes out the window it's uh, uh it still does convey all the water from the lot to that detention that's basin. a swale right this is a swale and that's what it's designed for that's right. water yep water. yes <laughs> Was this an existing lot or this was a subdivision? 
This was part of the modification. It was the additional land that was bought off of, uh, of uh, it was the Relic Farms, Disco Springs. Yeah. Uh, that uh, this piece used to be part of the Misco Springs property. Uh, and now will be one of the lots. It's one of the bigger lots in this area of the subdivision. But yeah, we flanked the, the entire length of that driveway with siltation barrier on the uphill side of the swale so that the vegetation can get established here. And we'll keep any, any erosion or any kind of sedimentation as to the max outside of the swale. Is that workable soil at all or is it all rocks? This is part of what we're doing. It, it is, we have a hunk of rock right here, right in this area. And the swale that we've talked to the planning board about it, uh, Jeff Walsh is the engineer for the planning board. And he has allowed us, and I'm hoping to get the same flexibility from the Conservation Commission, he's allowed us to move the swale about 25 feet at the worst point, right where the ledge is, towards the wetlands, but we are still outside of the 25 foot no disturb. But it's a minor adjustment. It involves about two to 300 feet of the swale at the worst point. Five feet closer, but still complies with your required steps. Because that's a very shallow pitch. That's yeah. Well, so. we're, we're this swale meanders. We're, we're just trying to keep positive pitch going downhill the entire route, obviously, <clears throat> uh, without having to excavate. We found. This is partially constructed under the definitive plan order conditions. And we found some ledge up here, and we found that if we kick it about 25 feet, we're going to be able to build up the swale on top of the ledge. Is that a ledge out cropping? Or is it no, it's, it's it subsurface. Yep. Right. So we're just kicking it over a little bit so we can build the swale. That whole length, is that continuous, or is every once in a while there's like an emergency little low spot where it's designed to overflow oh we have we have check dams wherever it gets steep at all we have uh riprap check dams for the whole length wherever it's needed wherever it gets a little steep uh we have a series of check dams to keep the water slowed down any other questions the board, any questions from the audience? Got a motion? Make a motion. A quick question what, on the well, right? You got the salt, I mean, the saltation barrier yes. and the salt and everything around that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the salt basin. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there a second? I uh, just question with those are some steep slopes. So that's going to be a three to one grass slope. What's the finished product look for the most? This is all three to one. When we get up to the fill for the apron for the driveway right at the house, yeah, we have two to one, but we have uh, it's limited, it's about this much of it is two to one. The rest is three to one. And some sort of special planting plan there, yes. We well, it, it's we're using drought resistant grasses, quick growing grasses, just to get it established. And we're, we're going to have to maintain this for a while before, uh, yeah, before so the order of conditions will sign off on, right? So it might make sense to make sure you plant something, Jim, off, oh, yeah, maintainable. We will, Jim. Yes. I think procedurally, we should get a second on this and we can continue. The discussion. I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other than what you just said? I, just, I, I agree. You know, just make sure you got something. Like so we're not, you're not pulling the silt out of the, uh, out of the we'll spend all that time doing that water quality swale, and then pulling the bank out of it. Right? Yeah. Okay. No, we don't want That's a lot more cost. Exactly. Okay. Um, Is there a schedule for when construction can start? Uh, I think they're going to start as soon as they get approval. You know, just to be able to get back there, they have to drill the well before they can get it. Any facilitation 
Uh, uh, yes, all along the swale. It, this this was uh, the siltation barriers were established quite a while ago, but they didn't complete the swale. They just opened it up. The swale's part of the subdivision, not part of this okay. lot. You're right. going to try to do everything together so you can yeah. stabilize everything. Yeah. Are there, any, are there any more siltation barriers and uh, protection to be put in place before construction? Oh, yeah, 605 feet right here on the downhill side of the drive. Utilities in the ground or is yes. Nice. Comfortable, Mr. Uh, I'm comfortable. I'm just making notes for the other side. I just want to make sure I don't want to pass something. Took a look at it. I think it's a good idea to move the uh, foil a little bit instead of drilling and blasting, causing uh, the big ruckus up there. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. And then we'll close the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm reading and close it at uh, 7.15. Okay. You got that right? Are you, I'm recording it. Okay. I'm recording it. Consider the... Uh, Excuse me, just a technical question. Do we have a clerk? Or are we no. likely to keep count on any time soon? I hope so. So who's taking minutes today? I'm taking some minutes. We got also be recorded. If, if it helps, Teams actually has a transcription feature now. It's not great. But That's better than nothing. <laughs> That's a lot better than nothing. Uh, I'm still going to take some notes. We will, uh, we'll add to the. Uh, I forgot my chisel and stone. I can probably a little quicker with the Consider approving the minutes for October 7th. Um, really wasn't a meeting, so we really don't have any minutes. So, um, there's no one's no flaw. So we're going to consider an extension of order of conditions for 12 Asylum Street, DEP number 2180739. Uh, we have a, the applicant is waiting for uh, National Grid to move some telephone home, but telephone company, whoever is in charge of that. Uh, it's been a long, long process, and they just would like to uh, extend this. Extended to 10 October 27, 2024. Extend for another year? 24. Three years. 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 Three Three years. Motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Who's full time? Verizon. Verizon. Uh, yeah. uh, National Kids <laughs> came out, marked everything, did all, did all the legal issues I got on it, and they said, don't have to tell you, they called it here. It's unbelievable. Well, they, well, they don't. What well, National Grid told me is they don't want to do the telephone calls anymore. All right, we got a meeting. We got to uh, about these two other things. We got to uh, consider a sign certificate of compliance for 44 Hartford Ave East. Uh, Susan Callahan, the other member that is not here, had left for Ireland tonight. She did an inspection on it. She did sign it. So. Certificate that she wasn't going to be here. Tim did it. I also. I also. Yeah. Uh, I got to kind of stay out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll make a motion to sign the certificate of compliance for 44 hours for the Abbey's. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Before our next uh, presentation at 7.30, 
we got an ongoing situation on the 106 Millville Road that we're going to have a little discussion with. There is not a cease and desist on that property due to multiple situations. Who issued that? Uh, Conservation Commission. Um, they had brought in thousands of not even know how many thousands of yards and built in that. Uh, I don't know if you're from the Kelly's old fourth farm here. You can even buy it. It's not reasonable anymore. You know, down, down the lower, the lower pasture. Yes. And now you can drive in and do that. There's a probably 30, 50 foot hill down to the wetlands. Brought in a ton of material. Just, just should be representing them. Is the owner here? Yes. The owner. Are you representing uh, I am. Okay. Joyce McCurry uh, and Papa uh, Animals also yeah. here. Uh, People are renting the property. Uh, the property. Uh, uh, and there is a culvert there uh, that somebody. Well, there was a culvert. The, well, the, remember the little pond used to be on yeah. the Fred's property? There was an overflow back there. So it went from there down to the left hand. Yeah. It's far. Something happened there. They were down the bottom there. I don't know how they were doing. And the pipe got broke. They thought they fixed the pipe. There was some question, but there, they fixed one pipe. But there is another pipe there. From the homeowner standpoint, it would be too soon. Because straight out, there's a cease and desist, obviously. So there's nothing that can be done to be fixed that pipe yet. Because they are working with body consultants. You know. And they're working with an architect to come up with a plan of what they're going to do with this atrocious problem. Okay. There's, there's, I mean, there's so funny down into the wetland right now, causing a big Is that because the pipe crashed? No, it's because it's steep slope. It must slope. fill right it's off at 20 yeah. feet. That's it's, it's, down. Just a big, it's just a big fill. Yeah, there is no engineering or anything. Yeah, there are there any bales up? The, up they got some soap fence up, but the damage is already done. So we haven't, we were looking a little bit of them to do some work, clean something, some stuff up. Then we kind of talked them up a little bit more, said, let's get a plan in place. Let's get the wetlands delineated so we know if he's even going to, he might, from what we can see, what we think the wetlands are, but. We'd like to know exactly where they are so that they can they can come up with a plan. They're they're present to us. So they're they're come up with a plan for uh see what's gonna hold this planting back. Yeah, I, I don't know what your plan is and what engineering you would use to, but it was pretty careless yeah. what you did. So I don't you're affecting other people in the wetland. Are, are you planning on putting a wall there? Is that what's I'm not sure they know what they're going to do yet. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of history on it. There was a tenant in there. We have evicted him. Uh, he was kind of, well, he was the one running the show. Uh, my client, uh, would you just state your full name and where you live? Uh, John Ladder. And, uh, the address is 635 Main Street, one of Thomas. Okay. So he lives in Water Town. So he rented it. He wasn't out here watching over it. Uh, we've evicted the person who was in there. Uh, we, we were in front of the Board of Health last night. You did see some pictures of a uh, uh, small um, excavator that had dug the area up. That was prior to us going in there. That's not, it's not our equipment. Um, and, uh, but look, we own it. So it looks like that, uh, whoever that was, assuming it was the tenant or someone working for him, uh, ripped that area up, damaged the pipe. The owner has evicted them. Uh, my father summary process, he's out. Uh, and now we're trying to fix it. Um, we fixed the pipe that we know of. And it's my understanding that, as I think some of the people are here, uh, that know better than us. Uh, it looks like there's a pipe coming from the pond that's on Lovell Street. So for those of us who have been here a million years, we know that um, a gentleman lived in the house uh, if you're on Lovell Street, be to the right of their house. He subdivided property, built that house, they put that pond in there. He also owned the red barn and all that property. So uh, more than likely, he just ran the pipes to wherever he wanted to. So it's, it's our belief that there's a, a corrugated metal pipe that they showed us pictures of that we weren't aware of that is damaged. And um, we're going to try to fix that as well. Is that that will virtually stop all of all of the uh, runoff issues we, we think we have right now, along with the cell fence. We'll be at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, 
so that we can walk it and actually try to get a look, good look at where this pipe is. It sounds like this pipe is buried in some of the silt that went down from the hill. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have an engineer figure out what, what to do with the hill. What's the best way to handle that? Um, we did hire uh, Mr. Goddard, uh, I think, is well known to the board. He's going to get involved and delineate the wetlands. Um, we have an architect. We also have a surveyor that, uh, um, if we need, that we hope will work with us on that property. And the goal is to get it straightened out, meet all the requirements, and make it nice. Uh, for those that don't know, there was there was a lot of stuff going on there. It was we initially thought maybe a petting farm, but it looks like there was talk of a slaughterhouse. I don't think any evidence was found of that by the board of health. However, there was what appears to have been an illegal restaurant running in there. Uh, that's been removed, of course. So as soon as the owner knew of these issues, he took action immediately. And uh, this is his um, general contractor, Mr. Alves, and the, both of them have, uh, everything I've passed on from uh, Conservation Board of Health, they've immediately agreed to do. I think uh, Mr. Tinio has actually gone down and looked at, at it and also, uh, you know, give us some advice on what the conservation is going to want. So, um, we're here tonight to tell you that we're well aware of the problem. We're also well aware that we own it. We're trying to put it together as quickly as we can uh, and work with the neighbors. Yeah. Well, quick, quick question. Um, you mentioned that. I just want to clear that, yeah, that material was not brought in by the, the people that were renting the property. Right, that was material was you you guys were in charge of the material that's brought in there by the trucks, right? I got involved in between when yeah. he, he brought it in. But the cowboy wasn't involved in that. Yes. Yes, he was. That was cowboy, yes. Yeah. So cowboy. But initially, initially. And right. then he got involved and there was still some coming in trying so to was cowboy still involved with the property that you own Hope Hill? We had nothing all the dirt to No, that's an entirely different. Okay. Picture. So so that you guys are whoever you guys are on that break with the material getting in there. So that's your well, you can, well for lack of a better name, the calibre was the one that started it. But yes, okay. we picked it up. Okay. But interestingly, we were also doing one at the same time in Hopedale. And that one we're in compliance with everything. Right, right. That's uh, how you did it the sewer and with the sewer department, local sewer department, because it's an easement. I uh, had them walk the property, they told us we were good. Started bringing in the fill there, and then I'm assuming someone made a complaint. They came back down, they checked again, and said, You're still good. I said, You know, if, if there's a problem, let us know. But this is where you told us was the line, and, and I don't, I think you'll find we haven't violated that. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, they, 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 you're, you're in charge. He's in charge now. He wasn't in charge initially. He came in kind of in the middle of this, and honestly, I don't even think he knew what was going on. Uh, because initially, I had been asked to come in and potentially represent the cowboy. And uh, the one time I was there, I was like, I wasn't even real sure what was going on. It was like some kind of a yeah. And then ultimately, we yeah. you know what happened. So, so moving yeah. forward here, so are we clear? So no, no work's being done. It's stabilized until the engineer and the wetlands guy can come up with something. No work is being done right now. Right. See, no work's being done right now, but we'd like you to at least consider um, us trying to get down in that ditch, fix that pipe. That they've talked about. That was my next question. Yes. So the pipe is that the pipe. The so this this pipe. pipe there's a there's a black plastic pipe. Uh, like and twelve inch of fifteen inch. Okay. Inch. And that one we fixed because that one we saw was damaged, and we didn't know that there was another pipe. But they showed us a picture of a of a corrugated metal pipe that we still haven't seen. But it's close to the pond, that pond. It looks like that's an overflow for that pond. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Kathleen Alexander. I live at 14 Long Street. And whoever dug up that ditch, whoever dug up the ditch, um, dug up the pipe, not just damaged it, okay. dug it up and took it out of the property. Oh, and it's the full length of that ditch. Who saw the property is the pipe on? It's well, it was a part of the three pipe. It's on everybody's property because right. I think when it, Fred owned it, he just he owned, owned, everything. All the he owned everything, right? Right. It went from the retention pond on my property through Mr. Meadows' property through um, Cormier's property 
and then into the pond. And so, so is that arguably one pipe connected stream to a protectable resource that even though it was a detention pond, if it's connected by a pipe and there's a channel, right? Well, they probably done before the wetland well, protection act would probably well it doesn't matter yeah. still so three say, it's, it's, right? no, I'm just saying, it's a pipe that ran from the overflow and it runs into the swamp yeah, still they took a piece out of that pipe so now it's draining into that silt it's draining into from that bin basin right but also years ago. yeah but okay. also um all of the wet all of the uh, rain or overflow from level street as well as millville road uh, comes through our property. Always, it, always have. Or? Uh, yes, and I, we had um, approved a, an easement to the town a couple of years ago on the other side of our stone wall, on the west side, okay. to stop the ice barrier on Low Street. So we're getting all of that water. Now, if that pipe is connected. That that overflow stays it stays way below the it stays right at the bottom of the pipe. Yeah. Now it's what you said, three or four inches up the pipe now. Yeah, it's about four inches. So it's probably leaching into that little, making everything wet in your property, yep. and yes. making everything wet in that. They made like a big sump down there, but it's full of silt now. So the question comes, they're restoring not so much the wetland, a little bit, but it's really the buffer zone. And whose judgment call as to bring it back to what it was? Got to remove all that, how many yards? I don't know. That would be Goddard. Because that's what, that's why Goddard's getting involved in. And the question, I can understand a, a tenant going crazy with the machine and doing something he shouldn't do. I don't understand a, a tenant hiring how many truckloads? Neighbors told me it was like for days and not, like Weeks. hundreds of trucks. Yeah, there's nothing else. So yeah, lots of joke here and there. He did a lot of things. He also had an illegal restaurant. He started cleaning the building. Right, right, but moving material onto a residential zone. Maybe Jim Stewart, he's got a big hole. Why can't he bring in Phil if he keeps it 100 feet from a wetland that he wants to put in an airport? But you don't just move Phil around for nothing. So it brings up all sorts of questions. What is it? And it needs to be gotten out of some place so trucking doesn't come free for my friends. So it, it does all right. the basic that's questions. What is it? Is it contaminated? People yeah. want to think it's the worst case scenario. Two places. Is it whole sand? Is it draper? And then switch and policy. Yeah. So I mean, so, we, we know now we know where. But it that's came a from. board of health issue versus right. a con kind of issue versus. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's why we're gonna. That's why God is gonna delineate the wetlands, and then we'll have a. a we'll see where our jurisdiction lies. And, and who's gonna delineate the quality of fill and put it? There's no fill in there yet. It's How many yards of no, fill? No, he, he needs the hill. Well, that's. Yeah. I mean, that's not our. I mean, we gotta. We gotta. We gotta do the buffer zone. And well, that's definitely within 150 feet of the buffer. Right. So then we'll make a decision when they come up with a plan. Yeah, we can't. We can't stop. Can't, yes. that's all I said. So my question, my question, uh, is there a dangerous situation now that they're shut down, or is there some emergency that needs to be done here to relieve the water? Well, to, that so, can affect it. So we think, and I'm going to turn over to Mr. Alice because uh, I don't know anything about that stuff. But we think that we we need to get in there and finish what we started with that pipe and fix their pipe. But I'll let you talk to because what he did tell me, and I and I. Related, I think, to the board was that you know the worry is when the next big rainstorm comes. Right. Right. But well, yes, uh, it does need to be stabilized. I would like to install more suit fence. I would like to you know stop crash tunnel around it so anything stay on the property and does not go over the wetland. Crush tunnel where at the top of the bay? Uh, or the base. Just to break the speed of the water so the or, or the flow. Even okay. crush tunnel. So right. before you go and do any. The crushed stone is not going to do anything you know, if you put it on top of the mud. So that square bin basin that you built to catch the water to let it leach into the ground. If there is a broken pipe from their property, we're going to fix it. That is the number one priority yeah. that needs to be fixed. And that's what we want before. To and then the silt that's in that has to be removed. You got to remove that if you want to put stone in there yeah. for a temporary fix. That's fine, but the pipe needs to be fixed. Yeah, I know. We, we, so what we'd like to do is fix the pipe and fix the ditch. And by the way, we didn't dig that. We didn't dig that ditch. We didn't dig that ditch. Okay. Good question. Uh, so I'll just do it one second. Yeah. So I'm so my farm here. I live at 16 Level Street. Okay. The idea of bringing any more material without a plan to succeed is not acceptable as far as I'm concerned. Well, Getting the plan is good. Fixing the pipe. 
definitely should be done. That was there, it should not have been broken. It should be there draining from the pond out so that our property does not does not become a So that's going to require bringing a new pipe and make some stone to bed yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's 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 all that's all you're gonna have to dig underneath that work, find where the pipe is. I'll show you where the, the pipe starts and where it should be. Okay. And then you'll have to dig, put crush on underneath it, put the pipe back in back in so it's got the right slope and it's so that we reestablish the flow of water. That's not a problem. Bringing any additional crushed stone to put at the bottom of the hill to try to stabilize it. No, I just want to get the, I just want the pipe fixed. I think that we yes. are all So that's what I'm saying. That's we what want I'm saying. You can have to bring a lot of stone in there to bed the pipe and get everything so it's going to sit in the proper uh, yep. place and stay. Absolutely. You have to dig yep. so that you put crushed stone and stabilize it. Um, it's just, so I thought that was that uh, Mr. Jader basically said bring crushed on to try to stabilize. Well, I think we just need to get the pipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, until it's the fixed the yeah. pipe. So that's why I rose my, rose my hand and raised my hand no, because I want gone. the pipe fixed, but everything else should wait until right. an actual plan has been set together so that we are successful in fixing this. Because that the, the pipe, the, if you see anybody that kind of sees the hill, the pits that that hill is, there is no way that it's stable. The next rainstorm will happen. The same thing that's happened several times. Yeah, It'll be road and we'll have a big crevice that goes down right. the bottom with mm -hmm. all the sand coming down at the bottom. There's no amount of pressure. That's not going to stop anything. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. Uh, Donna? Uh, give me your 16 level. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming forward and looking to resolve the item. Um, as my husband indicated, we would like to see a plan. Um, I'm very nervous about additional, any, you know, even another pound of material coming in. Uh, there is several stacks, uh, several piles of fresh stone that exist on the property that are already there. And so one would think that they could be repurposed. So my request is for a plan that it can be reviewed so we can look at it um, and ensure that it's uh, satisfactory. And also that any existing materials, provided that they are safe and not contaminated, could be used and nothing more brought in. Okay. Thank you very much. That, that's, I mean, absolutely. We agree. Well, I agree 100% that we need a plan before they do anymore. I just want that pipe fixed so that there is not anything that's leaching into the property of your your property or their property or backing up anymore. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think he's saying he needs to bring in more stone. I mean, you got to, how long do you think? Let's, let's see how long the pipe is. If you don't have, if you need a six wheel load or Couple of few yards of stone to bed the pipe. Yeah. I mean, that, that's understandable. And it's not going to stone it. The pipe is probably close to 50 feet long. 50 feet long. long. So you're going to need a lot of. I think he's going to need a lot more stone, but at least uh, uh, 15 years. <laughs> and we can bring it and you can come look at it yep. before it's done. I mean, you guys are right there, so you keep an eye. If there's any questions or any problem that you see that's not going the way, you're having a discussion tomorrow with these people. No Please just let me know. When, you have my number. Yep. When, when is the uh, engineer going out there to take a look at that? Uh, well, so the first guy that's going on is Mr. Goddard, and I'm not entirely sure I'm going to call him tomorrow. He said, let me know what happens at conservation. He says, but I, he says, I'm busy, but I'll get out there. So my sense is he's going to be out there before the end of next week. Before I make any, <laughs> try to make any decisions and figure out what what the problem is there. I would like to see it. Yes, I would like to see it. Um, I can't be there tomorrow morning. I'll take a ride out there Saturday. Yeah. So if you see a black pickup truck out there in this space, that would be me looking around. And you know, you know what, Mike? And it's easier yes. for you to go in on off the level street at their house, at front door, mm -hmm. one of those two houses right there. Okay. You can access their driveway and get to the bottom where the situation is close to the wetlands. Before we leave, um, I can know. So if I use my phone number so you can call me. Okay. Tell me when you're there. Well, you'd be there. Right? And that, you feel comfortable with that? Yep. Yeah, we'll be in, um, we'll be at a wedding on Saturday, but um, yeah. we certainly yeah. could permission. He can control where the pipe yeah, needs exactly. to be. And then you, you'll be there at the meeting tomorrow morning. Mr. Chairman, how, how can we fast track this? So depending on how turn around on your engineer, we have to wait till our next meeting to review it and give them notification because we're lo losing time in the season. Right? Well, I think the problem is going to be is we need to the, having a, get an architect to draw something up. I don't know, a 
week or two. He already has an architect, so um, he'll get him right on it probably tomorrow morning. We got another meeting in two or three weeks. I mean, well, I mean, you could have. Something. I'd like to think we'd be coming to your next meeting with with a, a good solid plan. And and the another the biggest thing is we at least one of somebody can drive by there. If you can get the wetlands flag. That's going to make things a little easier for us to determine. Um, we, how far away you are from the wetlands, how right. far into the buffer you are, right. how much material has to come out of there. If it needs to, you know, if you need to come back 20, 30, 50, 100 feet, well, no, yeah. you know, yeah. and if that's the situation, then, you know, now you get into a, a building, a structurally sound wall that's presentable, you know, it's aesthetically correct and he wants to, uh, Sunil wants to be a good neighbor oh, that's and uh, definitely wants to work with him. Okay. When did the eviction become effective? So he, he, I gave him the notice to quit um, about three weeks ago, and uh, I'm, I filed a summary judgment, but at this point I'll probably withdraw it because he's he's already left. He left a couple days ago. He left a couple days ago, turned in the keys, so everyone's gone. So there's probably no reason for me to waste my client's money and still do the summary judgment. Okay. There's no he's gone. Gone. Not, not one at, tomorrow morning you guys have a conversation. Let me know how everything goes. I can't be there at 9 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. But let me know what the, what the outcome is. And if, if you're going to bring any stone in there, I'll call you. Let me know. Let them know. know so we are all on the same page. You can make sure that anyone who wants to inspect it when the truck gets there, they can get to look at it. What's that? What's the purpose of this? Uh, to, to go to the neighbors and, and, and have them show us all of the issues for them. And specifically, show us where that pipe is. Uh, we, you know, we want to we want to really work with that and have them be the charge. Would that be there? I will be there. I mean, that pipe is the biggest thing. I mean, because if, yeah. if that backs up to their property and causes problems with their septic system or whatever it is, it's just that we're going to be more problems that you guys have to, you know, regardless if you dug it up or not. Sorry, yeah, no, we, no, you've never heard us make an excuse. No, no, I know. No, let's just, you know, just try to make it right and keep everybody on the same page. You know, and but, I, I would have to be there. One more question. Yep. Um, we were mentioning um, getting a plan as an architect, an engineer to do, to draw all of this up. Um, I would like to, as soon as you have it, if you could make it, I would like to get it checked out as well. And the penalty is to make sure that everything is been. Not and we're gonna we'll, that will come in front of us at a meeting where you'll have to be able to voice your concerns, yep. and we'll have to vote on it. So it's not going to be just something we're gonna run. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Well, I, I, I just want to. I just want to get a double check. Oh no, that that's that's okay. Yeah, he wanted to get one to have someone look at it, and as as I told him last night, the more people that look at it, the better off we all are. Yeah, you know, I, I would rather have that. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll do it once and make everyone happy. All right. All right, so good. You good, you guys are good? No, good. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a conversation with you guys? Oh, you got it. I get a hold of you sometimes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, are you good now to go? Or do you sure, go? we can go right over here. Okay. All right, um, presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, can you hear any yell on it? You're my backup. Three against one. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, okay. Have Who's here to? You guys want to come up a little closer so you can hear what's going on in case it's not loud enough on the speaker. They're more than happy to. Everybody's here, so whatever you are ready. Yeah, thank you. Just trying to uh, get a presentation up here and share a screen. 
So this is some of the money supplemental environmental projects that was enhanced from uh, paper. The storage across from Norway. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a tough act to follow, but um, hopefully this will be an interesting conversation as well. This is positive. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. <yes. laughs> Uh, my name is Matt Ladwig. I'm a certified lake manager in the ESS group. Um, and we were, as you know, we were hired to complete this study of Lake Nipmuc. It's really a baseline assessment study just to see how the lake is doing now. Um, it's not a completely thorough diagnostic type study, but it is at least setting some baseline data for us to say what else do we need to do here if we want to find out more, if we want to do more. Um, so what I'll go over tonight is pretty, you know, comprehensive, the basic data set for this year, and we can kind of have the conversation and take it from there. Uh, so just uh, some background for people who are not aware of what the scope of the product was. Uh, we essentially had five tasks. Um, the first was product kick kickoff an existing data review task. Uh, we did hold, hold that remotely at the time uh, back on May 12th, and I think there were Members of the commission, as well as the public um, and the Lake Association, that was in that meeting. Uh, based on the outcome of that meeting, we did make a few adjustments to where we were planning to do some of our sampling just to better uh, meet the needs of uh, observations that we made at the lake previously by, by people who were more familiar with it than, than we were at the time. Um, so I think it made it into a better study, given the budget that we had to work with. And then the actual uh, study itself consisted of uh, three tasks. Uh, one was surface water sampling. So this is pretty easy to understand. Uh, we went out and did a dry weather uh, sampling event on June 25th. And then as you know, we had a lot of rain this year, so it was not hard to find a wet weather sampling event. And we had one of the many big storms that came through in July to uh, be able to do that. Um, that was mainly sampling in and around the lake, uh, looking at flows coming into or going out of the lake. Um, in addition, we also completed a groundwater seepage survey. So this is looking at the shallow groundwater coming into the lake. That was done on September 13th. And I'll have results and some more information on all these things to come. And then we also completed an, an actual in-lake sampling event as well as some mapping. Uh, so that would involve definition mapping, looking at the water depths, uh, water plant mapping and then actually collecting water quality samples from the lake. So that occurred on multiple visits, uh, April 28th, June 8th, and September 13th. So we essentially got to see a little bit of each of the seasons uh, this year. And then uh, finally, we've got task five, which is the presentation tonight, and we'll have a report to follow. So that's kind of where we were and where we're going. And now we can go ahead and jump into some of the results. Uh, so just to sort of set the stage, first of all, uh, as most of you are probably aware, Lake Nipmuc is uh, an 87 acre great pond. It's got a very small watershed. So the watershed is only about uh, half a square mile. Um, so it's, you know, relatively speaking, the lake itself makes up a large portion of the watershed. Um, and you can see much of the watershed in that aerial photo to the right. Some of the slopes around the lake are forested, but there's a lot of residential development uh, on the immediate shoreline of the lake. The geology in the area uh, is pretty much till and bedrock. Um, there's some areas of exposed bedrock where it comes to the surface. Uh, where there isn't bedrock, there's a little bit of till, but it's not very thick. So we don't really have a big juicy aquifer here. We've got you know, not very much uh, deposit on top of bedrock, so pretty thin. And soils around here. There's no perennial tributaries coming into the lake. Um, you know, where there are some flows that, that come in, but they seem to be more seasonal. And then the outlet is Meadow Brook, and that flows to the Blackstone River. Um, so to do the potential mapping, we actually went out and surveyed the entire lake uh, with a number of points. Um, we used a combination of an echo sounder and um, sounding rods to be able to measure the water depths of the lake. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side here, this is a new bathymetry map uh, created for the lake based on our results. That dark blue water, that's the deepest part of the lake. Um, that's 20 to 25 feet deep. And the kind of pale blue color is the shallowest. That's one that's less than five feet deep. 
you can see here is a big central basin in Lake Nipmuc, and it's separated from that shallower north basin by kind of a ledge. Um, so, at, you know, this year the water levels are pretty high, which I think enhanced the connectivity of those two basins. But during a low uh, water year, you might have some separation there, which could really impact the water quality in that north basin. And even at high water, it may still do that just because of that sort of physical barrier there. Uh, the southwestern part of the lake, there's a few shoals, and I'm sure everybody knows of the islands that are there. Uh, so it's a little bit more interesting bathymetry there. There's some drop offs and some really shallow spots. Uh, we got about a max depth of about 25 feet and an average depth of actually over 10 feet because there's, it actually drops off pretty quickly uh, on the northern so the sides of the lake there. So that's just sort of an introduction to. Um, the lake, you'll see if there's a, a bunch of our sampling sites that are also here. I'll bring this map up later. We can kind of go through what those are. Switch to the next slide on my screen. There we go. Uh, and here's a description of what we did for the aquatic plant mapping. So, uh, as I indicated before, we went back we went out in June. Um, there was a treatment by water and wetland uh, the day after we mapped. So, we got out there before they did any chemicals. So this is, you know, it's early in the season, but it's a pretty representative map for what was out there uh, before it was actually you know, altered by the herbicides. And you'll see on the right hand side here, um, the green cover or the green, um, uh, yeah, the green cover is, is pretty sparse plant cover, uh, less than 25% uh, cover for the most part. Uh, the yellow areas are 25 to 50%. So this is just kind of looking down. Imagine you're really looking at the lake and mapping it straight down. You would see, you know, 50 to 75% of the bottom would just be exposed sediment in those yellow areas and the rest of the plants. And we do have a few orange areas in here, but they're very, very limited. Those are 51 to 75%. So that's what you really start to notice the plant cover being pretty dense. Um, at the time, and I know from looking at aerial photos, there are places that get very dense later in the year. By the time that we did the mapping and under the conditions that we did it under, um, we didn't really find any areas of super dense plant growth. Uh, we did, however, find growth down to 20 feet. So even though um, the lake is you know, moderately deep, um, there are plants that can survive down that far. Most of them are really small. In fact, um, most of what we found at that depth is actually macroalgae, technically. Um, it has a little more structure to it. And most of the vascular plants were in the top 10 to 15 feet. Uh, we did find 12 native species of plants. Um, we also unfortunately found three aquatic invasive species. None of them were particularly dense or widespread at the time that we were out there. Um, but I know that there have been some maintenance projects in the lake in the past. And so um, the idea is that they probably been kept at bay. And that's a good thing because uh, all three of them can get out of hand very, very quickly. So. Uh, one of them we found is Eurasian milfoil. Uh, then we have its, uh, its sibling, very relief milfoil. Both of those are pretty bad. Uh, but neither of them is as bad as water chestnut, which, um, and I'll introduce all these, these plants in the following slides. But uh, these, are, these are three of the big invasives that we have in the region, and um, we want to try to avoid uh, letting these take over the lake whenever possible. Yeah? You didn't find any purple loose drive? Uh, well, it is around the lake, um, and you know, Phragmites, your common reed, is also present. Um, we were just focused on the aquatic plants; those are sort of more emergent okay. plants. Okay. So that's sure. Is it aquatic? Not truly aquatic. No. Um, and the management would be very different because we wouldn't put stuff in the water or have divers go down to control it. So, it is there, right? Um, so, for each of these different species, we'll start with the variable leaf milfoil. Um, these Green patches uh, in the south, south uh, part of the lake and the western part of the lake, which are actually pretty sparse, are where we found the milfoil. Um, the photo in the middle and the left is kind of what it looked like. So, you know, there were a few plants out there, but it wasn't ridiculous. Usually, in a lake where you have a bad infestation, you can see top out and you won't really be able to get a boat there. So, uh, not too bad, but it was present. We've spent a lot of money, though, right? How many years? <laughs> Maintaining it. I mean, it's yeah, I mean, it's it's good. Good. yeah, we're in there every year. We've been doing it for, for the 35 years. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, but we didn't do it. This would probably look like that. Uh, what's that? Uh, with the watch has to go. Yeah, then. Uh, 
inventory. That inventory. Mean, I mean, I think for the most part, we've kept things at bay. I mean, you tell me. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it looks pretty good. They're obviously still there, and they'll keep coming back every year. Sure. So you got to keep after them. But I mean, this is you can work with this. It's, right. <laughs> it's not a crisis. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there anything that we can do? I mean, unfortunately, we we have we don't have fifteen, you know, ten thousand dollars a year to spend on it. We have close to the five thousand dollars a year. So we try to do what we can do for the. And there has been years where they said, okay, we're not going to we're not going to take care of that plant this year because it's not that bad. But this one it looks a little worse. So let's use the money wisely and and. Uh, you know, attack that one instead of this one. I mean, it's changes. I mean, I don't know. It's, that's why we're doing this. That's yeah. It's a good reason for doing that. Um, and you'll see at the end one of the things that we recommend is sort of putting together a plan so that you can foresee what kind of funding you'll need, what kind of strategy you might want to have for tackling not just this but other water quality issues in the lake. Um, which you know, we didn't see a lot of critical issues. Just to give you sort of a preview. But there are some things that could become more problematic if they're not dealt with. So, you know, I think at the end of this, really kind of moving us to the next stage would be coming with a, a long-term plan to manage the lake so that you guys can stay ahead of this, whatever your budget ends up being, and know what you're going to spend and know how you're going to do it. Well, if the milfoil is only in those little spots, is it the kind of thing that makes it worse if you break it up, or could you treat that and but this is early in the season before it's had a chance to spray. Yeah, well, yeah, it's only in those spots right now. And it, if you do certain things to it, you're right, they would break up and fragment. This is one of the species that spreads by fragmentation. So you don't want to physically disturb it in a way that at least fragments all over the rest of the lake and start new beds everywhere else. Mm -hmm. It would be better to sort of keep these isolated and control them Chemicals. as they are. This is a perennial plant, so it's going to come back year after year unless you get the roots. Now you say you get the roots, you go in there with a diver, and, and it's one way to do it. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you don't just go by and sprinkle it on the top. It doesn't really need to do. It. No, I mean, yeah, you would want to, if you were going to physically remove it, you would want to get a diver. In. And you physically take it out like you're weeding a mulch bed. Right. Yeah, it's not easy work. <laughs> uh, so those, those spots look small. On here, but to put a diver in there and start doing it is probably not that small. Yeah, no, I think all the all the plants that we mapped this year, the bases were all under an acre, which is pretty good for a lake of this size, especially since you had established um, infestations for a while. Um, but that's still a lot if you need to do it by hand, right? Um, and here's another one you may be familiar with, Eurasian milfoil. It's a little bit less robust a plant than the variable leaf, but has a similar life cycle. Uh, we just found it down in the outlet this time. Here I've got sort of a picture of what that looks like when it starts getting bad on the left. You see it's kind of topped out and the water's kind of gunky around it because there's just nothing moving through. It's all plant, plant matter. Uh, but what we actually found is here on the right. So that's um, not a lot of growth there, just a few plants here and there, but it is there. And then this is the doozy, water chestnut. Um, thankfully, that middle photo was what we found. <laughs> and actually, I'm not even sure if that was attached or if it was a rosette that had become detached. Um, I don't know if you guys are doing plant harvesting at all uh, at the lake, but it could just be something that somebody missed or it kind of physically got detached from it. Um, but on the left here, I've got a photo from another pond uh, in southeast New England, where water chestnut got in control, and you can almost walk across the pond. So, so that's all you saw in Nipple. That's all we saw. There's one Nipple. little rosette. So that could have been from a bird, right? But that's how it starts. <laughs> that's how it starts. So with water chestnut, it's different. It's an annual plant. <laughs> they don't, and it's actually very easy to pull out. You just have to get it before the seed set. So the seed set usually in August, drop by September. If you get it out there and pull all the water chestnut in July, it's up, and you can see all the rosettes really easily, you should be good for the next year, unless there's a seed bank that's already been established. So once it gets to that point on the left, you know, that's a decade of work to even get close to getting rid of that. You can get rid of it every year and just keep coming back. Yeah, I think that's what we had on the thing that spent thousands and thousands of dollars on. I thought they were going to have it. 
And then it just became. It started off with a three year program and turned out to be eight years. Yeah. And now it's still got yeah. ahead of the game. It's like a that. lot better than it was. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, 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 I'm I, sure, but. For what it could be, but you want it stopped. Yeah. But that's nature's way of changing a wetland into natural. Well, we might get there, but it's a question. You're either going to have weeds or algae if there's too much nutrients, or we're in pretty good shape. Well, I think it's unrealistic to, to think that this would be a, a, you know, another swimming beach, but it will never be a swimming pool, right? No. Um, and it probably should. <laughs> no. But um, uh, I think there are ways to maintain uh, aquatic plant growth and keep algae growth at bay. And then, I'll talk about some of them here. There's a cost associated with all of them, obviously, but some of it can still be prevention. Um, so there's a combination of things that can be done to keep things from getting worse in the future. Because you're right, if you, if you go from a lot of plants, you take all the plants out, the next year you may have an issue with algae if you haven't gotten rid of the nutrients. Anyone else? So that's, that's the aquatic plants and the mapping that we did for the bathymetry. Um, and again, it was, it was a pretty thorough survey. It was a little early season, but you know, I think we at least um, got a pretty good sense for what was out there. We just want to make sure we got there out there before they started treating, because that would obviously affect the results. Um, so that seems to be in pretty good shape on the plant end for what it is. Um, and here, uh, it may be a little hard to read where these sites are. Tom was nice and clear in the presentation before, but. Um, I'll just kind of describe where these sites are. So site one, that's the town beach. Uh, we did two events. One was during dry weather and one was during wet weather. Obviously during dry weather, you're not really getting low at the town beach. So we just kind of took that at the shoreline at the beach area. We just take it scooping right off the top. Yeah, right. just below the surface, yeah. And then during wet weather, we actually sampled the water that was running down on, onto uh, right next to the beach. Um, two is uh, an outfall off of um, uh, the highway there, um, sort of in the western part of the lake, on um, the north uh, shoreline. And that was um, a wet weather sample, so low really during dry weather. Um, site three uh, was the outlet, so we actually went down to where the water discharges out of the lake, and we only did that during dry weather, basically dry weather event, we were able to get uh, to places where you needed to go pretty easily. Um, site four, uh, that was a pipe that we found that had some dry weather flow during our initial investigations of the pond. And uh, based on the conversation we had at the kickoff meeting, nobody really knew what it was. So we just decided we'd go sample what was coming out of that. So we did do collect the sample from that uh, during dry weather. And then site five is up at the northern end of the shoreline, um, past that shallow cove. We were made aware that there's like a shallow or a uh, seat there along the shoreline. Um, that flows seasonally, and um, we ended up targeting that. We wanted to actually make that dry weather event, but when we went for that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the water wasn't flowing sufficiently to be able to collect the samples, so we had to wait for uh, wet weather. So we did get a, a, a wet weather event uh, sample for that. And then site six is just the in lake uh, sample location, it's really sort of surface and the bottom, plus we did a full profile of um, water quality parameters that we can measure in the field out there. And I say there's one partial because we actually went out a second time and just did the full profile, but didn't collect any lab samples. Um, our scope only had one event, but since we we're out there, we just decided, you know, let's collect one anyway. And then finally, there were four groundwater sampling stations around uh, the lake. We had intended actually put one up close to that site five, the dry weather um, seepage that was coming off the shoreline. But we actually couldn't get our, our samplers in that location. The sediments just weren't adequate for it. Um, so we had to move it down closer to the town beach, but it's still sort of in that, that northern part of the lake. And then. Uh, so water, that, that is, you will go in the pond, down in the sand, yep. trying to pick up what's coming horizontally? Correct. Yeah, so there's two parts of it. There's, um, and I'll describe it a little bit too, but. There's a part that measures how much flow is coming in that we leave out all day. And there's another part where we actually actively like pump the water, <clears throat> excuse me, out for a sample and do the water quality sampling off that. So you have both the quality and the quantity. And then groundwater two is kind of over by where site two was sort of in that westernmost cove. Um, and groundwater three 
is down at the bottom of that south base mountain of Kinsley Road or Kinsley Lane. And Groundwater 4 is in the southeastern corner, uh, also sort of where Kinsley Lane and Taft are uh, the, the intersection is. So um, we just want to make sure that we got four locations that were kind of representative of different parts of the, of the lake just to see what's coming in. Are we getting groundwater flow in everywhere? Are we getting it out in some places and in other places? If it's in, what's the quality like? Um, so that we could get an idea of what's coming into the lake through groundwater sources. So uh, here's some of the, the results that we got. So this is the surface water results uh, for the in-lake samples. Um, and here I'm showing what we measured in the lake. So on the right, you can see two graphs, one from June 8th, uh, which is early summer, and one from September 13th, which is late summer. You'll see on June 8th, uh, we had dissolved oxygen, pretty adequate. That's that blue line uh, pretty much throughout the whole water column. It drops off a little bit at the bottom just as you're hitting the sediments. But for the most part, we had more than 10 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. So that was essentially pretty saturated throughout the whole water column. So that, that was great. Uh, and then as we move through the summertime, you can see that blue line moves over to the left to, towards zero at the bottom of the lake. And that means that there's no oxygen. <laughs> it's zero. Um, so a lot of things happen when you run out of oxygen. Fishing um, standard is five or five for warm water. Yeah. Five. Um, and we did have five throughout most of the water column, so you'll see like down to about five meters, which is 17 feet. So we had pretty good dissolved oxygen. So it wasn't like the whole pond was without oxygen, just sort of that bottom area, um, maybe the last three to five feet or so uh, had pretty low oxygen levels. Uh, part of that is a function of the, the water column warming. So you'll see that red line as the temperature in June, water's cooler, so it can hold more oxygen. So um, these are all you know, degrees centigrade. So we had you know, 12, 13 degrees throughout the whole water column there in June. And then by September, the, the surface of the lake is pretty warm. The bottom waters are still kind of cool relative to that. So you get that curve that shows the warm waters at the surface and the cooler waters at the bottom. Um, but as you go through the summertime, and there's organisms living at the bottom or dying at the bottom and being broken down by fungi and bacteria and that sort of thing, it uses up oxygen, so you start running out of oxygen as you get wider, farther and farther in the summer. What bad things happen without oxygen? <laughs> well, you, you take all of your pathways from aerobic pathways to anaerobic pathways. So one of the things that that could generate. Methane? Well, there's, yes, methane. Um, there's also some chemical reactions that happen that may allow metals that are bound to the sediments to be released. So they go from an oxidized state where they're tied up in the sediments to a reduced state where they're released into the water. Um, and so that's that's something that you really don't want. You want to kind of avoid that. Um, Hopefully we don't have any contaminated sediments. I don't know, it's historic use or might mercury in the rain, right? But well, you got the so the a gas pipe station at the corner for how many years? There's from two the pipes coming in. There's one coming in over by the old marina that comes in, from, that's, that comes off of Route 16. Mm -hmm. There's the catch basins in the road. They have very shallow sumps. When it gets heavy rain, sometimes you get sediment in that in the lake at the end of the pipe. There's another one over past Alicante, kind of in that area there, that comes in to that area. So, I mean, the stuff that they use on the roads now this in the winter time nowadays rots your car out in a year. Um, would that be damaging? Is that, I mean, is that something that they would they would cause any problems? With the so we actually did we measured specific uh, conductance as well. I didn't put that in the presentation. It'll be in the report. Um, we didn't really find a lot of difference in uh, different parts of the lake for that particular parameter. And that's just sort of a measure of how much salt there is in the water. Yeah. So if you have lots of salt, salts are ionic, they just associate to the two ions when you put them in water, and then you can run you know, electric current, and essentially that's what you're measuring. Um, so yeah, road salt will very easily get in there. It will degrade water quality over time. It becomes more of a problem if you're using it for drinking water. Is it a temporary thing? It only happens like, like so say, we get heavy snowfall and using a lot of salt in that particular area. 
that count by June? Yeah, probably not. So, so you would see it if you picked it up. I mean, if it was there, you would you would have you would have noticed that there was high content, soft content, or high chemical content of whatever they're using. Whether it's salt with they they treat the salt with uh, a liquid chemical now. Right. You know, I'm not saying, but I never, never said it was an issue before. Just asking questions, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if we want to look at this as a question. You'd really want to get samples collected during snow melt events and compare them to what you're getting in the summer just to see you can see how it kind of drops off. I would expect it to drop off, but one thing we found elsewhere, maybe less of a problem here, is that the salts can get into the soils and then leach out <clears throat> over time. And so even if you stop salt in the roads, you might have salt still coming into the lake for years. Yeah, okay. That's not looking for. I just was curious. Thank you. Um, so the, the green line here, the horizontal green line, that's the secu disc um, depth. And for anybody who's not aware what a secu disc is, it's basically just a black and white disc you drop down. And you drop it until you can't see it anymore. When you can't see it, that's the measurement that you get. Um, so deeper measurements are better. It means that you have more clarity to the water. You have a lot of algae or sediment or other stuff going on in the water that but if it impedes the visibility, your second disc reading will go down. And by down, lower depth, uh, going, instead of having three and a half meters like you did here, you know, really bad uh, lakes and ponds, maybe less than a meter uh, visibility during the summertime. Because it's so down. 10 feet is not bad. It's pretty good. It's not bad. It's, it's not great. But, you know, I don't know what the original condition of the lake was either. So we've never had this. We've never done this type of a um no. right. you know, water quality survey so we don't really even have a baseline at all and that's the whole point of this is just kind of set the baseline so we say hey look we're at three and a half or three in september we don't want to go backwards and start having summers where we're down at two with one and a half and one then at least gives us a place to say let's try to maintain what we got now um and then the other horizontal lines in here are just where we collected our surface and bottom sample um, uh, discrete samples, so like a half meter down, basically elbow depth at the surface, and then at six meters, which is almost the bottom line. So that, that just sort of gives you a little bit of a, a view into what happens over the course of the summer, how the lake changes. You know, year to year, you expect this to vary a little bit. And some years would be more severe, some would be more similar between the two. I think this is kind of an unusual year just because we've had kind of a cool July and a wet summer. A dry summer would probably look very different, but it gives you a spot to start with. Um, there's a lot of data here. So a lot of most of it came from Dan. Um, all the stuff on the right hand side is the town uh, measurements uh, monitoring at the beach for Lake Um uh, But we'll start with phosphorus, which is not on the right hand side here. Just to give you an idea of what we found in Lake. So at the surface, we found actually really low phosphorus levels. It was, um, you know, below 10 ppb, which is less than one milligram per liter. So that didn't seem to be a problem. Um, we found higher phosphorus near the bottom of the lake. And remember what I mentioned earlier about things happening when you go anoxic. That is a potential sign. And again, it's one reading, so we can't read too much into it. But potential sign that you may have phosphorus being released from the sediments in the middle of the sun. Which is when you don't want it, because that's right. where the plants can be. Right. And it's a, it's a a source of phosphorus that's there because phosphorus came in late in the past. So even if you stopped all the phosphorus it's coming still in there from the watershed, there could still be there's still phosphorus in the lake. And under those kinds of conditions, you may get a release of phosphorus. Um, again, it's just one reading. So if you had more data, we can make a better determination of whether that's really a problem or not. Um, but at this point, just an indication there might be something happening there. Is the primary source of phosphorus? Uh, fertilizer, non fertilizer? I, I don't know for sure here. I would say at this point it's unlikely to be just because it's hard to buy fertilizer with phosphorus in it anymore, except for the starter phosphorus in at least Massachusetts. Um, there may be some legacy phosphorus in the soils that's accumulated over time from you know decades of fertilizing lines. Um, and then obviously there's other sources of phosphorus in the atmosphere contributes. Phosphorus lakes as well. 
and it can actually be pretty significant in Surrey too. Um, but yeah, so it comes from all different places, and there probably is some reason where it's of phosphorus. The other way you can get into the lake, and we'll kind of take a look at this later too, is through groundwater. So septic systems, even if they're working correctly, they will release some of this into the soil, and eventually you'll build it up to a point where it's getting into the lake. So um, that could be another source as well. Uh, we also took a look at nitrogen. We had less than a milligram per liter at the surface in the bottom. Um, use kind of, you know, one milligram per liter as a rule of thumb. If it's way above that, you probably have an egregious problem. If it's <laughs> below that, uh, it's not necessarily great, but it's probably not terrible. Um, the readings that we got were like, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 or so on the nitrogen. Most of it was in the form of yellow delta nitrogen, which is uh, just a fancy term for ammonia plus or anything that's tied up in organic matter. So, you know, if you drop a leaf in the lake, it's got nitrogen in it, nitrogen is down up in the lake that goes into this yellow delta nitrogen part of it. We actually did detect nitrate or nitrate nitrogen there. It doesn't mean it's not there, it just means that the lab detection of it, um, which was pretty low, was it was they couldn't detect it in the sample. And in the bacteria sample that we did, we got around 50 to 60 MPN uh, on E. coli. And you can kind of compare that with the town beach monitoring results at the right. Um, so it's sort of in between some of the higher and the lower numbers kind of in the middle. Or you might expect the natural water body to be just because there's water sitting around. It's coming into uh, contact with organisms. There's wildlife and people in the watershed. So you're going to have some E. coli there. Um, definitely not egregious numbers, but they're um, nothing like what we saw in 621 at the beach where we had the 816 measurement. Yeah, well, why is that? Is that the rate of it? Dan, do you remember, was that a rate of it? I have to, I yeah. don't know. That's <laughs> well, there's three of them. I they, think they so. Jump. They go, yeah. Go. yeah, I think so. The 100s definitely were. I don't know. There were a lot of rain events this summer, so I wouldn't be surprised. The, day? the worst was June 23rd, or June 21st was the sample. Didn't you have like a, yeah, a lot of rain before? Because I went to my son's wedding like the first week in June. You would have like lots of rain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was June and July were both very wet months. I remember that. So, um, yeah, I guess there, we didn't find any critical issues uh, looking at the in lake water quality results. Um, and now we have third baseline, it's just a snapshot of something. Uh, looking at other sources, so these are things coming from you know, the watershed for the most part. Uh, during our dry weather sampling, we found pretty modest levels of phosphorus, really no red flags at any of those sites. So on the right-hand side, you'll see here the sites that we sampled during dry weather, uh, which is right at the beach, um, at the outlet of the pond, and at, the, at that dry weather flow pipe that I told you about, site four on the southwestern side of the pond. Um, so really, <laughs> red flags on phosphorus during dry weather was pretty pretty moderate. Uh, nitrogen was pretty high in that pipe, so we had over a milligram per liter. Remember I said that's kind of a rule of thumb. If you've got more than one, something's probably up. Uh, but E. coli was very low, so no bacteria in there and almost no phosphorus. So that's not really like a straight wastewater uh, sign, but there might be some septic issues going on there, at least interacting with whatever's going on a pipe, or it could be something completely different. Yeah, I'm just not sure. Um, and in bacteria, we, you know, like I said, we had generally in the 50s to 60s in the lake. At the outlet on, on this particular sampling event, we were down 13, and in the pipe, we had nothing. So, um, no more red flags there, just that, that total nitrogen uh, reading that was a little bit high in the pipe. And then during wet weather, we saw some more interesting stuff. So, all the highest concentrations for phosphorus, nitrogen, and bacteria were all right off the beach there, runoff coming off the beach. So we had phosphorus up around 50 ppb, uh, until nitrogen of two, um, and we had E. coli in thousands. Is that the beach or is that the channel that runs the channel on the channel? Yeah. So I tried to distinguish that here, you know, when during dry weather, we actually took it in the lake at the beach, and then during wet weather, we took it from that channel running down to the channel okay. that, that, that water. Um, and in site two, which is the stormwater outfall, um, that was kind of in the middle. We had 27 ppb on the phosphorus there. 
Uh, nitrogen was sort of elevated, but not ridiculous for stormwater, really. Um, and then the E. coli was around 68. Again, not ridiculous for, for stormwater. And, um, I'm sure that in fact, one of the challenges of stormwater, obviously, is you don't have the same concentrations throughout the whole storm. So the first part of the storm tends to be the dirtiest, and then it gets cleaner and cleaner, and it's all the stuff that's accumulated on the surface gets washed away. Um, we try to take it as close to the beginning of the storm as possible, but uh, we weren't in all three places. The same so what's your guess at the 4200? Is that bird poop? Is that uh, geese on the beach, or is it more in that channel, so it's on the road? or? That's a good question. This is what I can. What we did learn as part of the work that the highway department did, the, out, the actual outlet of the pipe was much further up than we thought. So there was a large area where water was just like stagnating and sitting. And that's not a good thing for and, bacteria. Right. That's since been kind of cleared. So now it just goes. It doesn't get stuck in a big, you know, puddle up there. Is that where the testing was being done? So this is that work was probably done after all this was completed. That was part of the, the stuff he did with the fire access. But it was just, you know, basically how many years of junk and overgrowth and whatnot. And weeds. So I don't know. I don't know if that would make a difference. Can bacteria grow up and sit there if conditions are right, or is this one? Yeah. If you have clean leaves and home on the street and you add water, you're going to get bacterial. And you wouldn't think these leaves necessarily being, you know, a really big source of these kinds of bacteria, but they are. If they're sitting on the street and they sit in water and then that goes to storm water drain and it's out of the lake, it actually grows. Bacteria grows really quickly. So it could also be runoff. That includes, you know, goose species. Definitely there's you know, geese around during the summertime and they like to eat and poop near the lake. And if there's a nice clear pathway for the runoff, to go right past where they were doing that, it's going to carry you know all the nutrients and the um, you know bacteria with it. So that definitely could be back. Uh, we actually found the lowest concentrations at site five, which is that that shoreline flow all the way up at the north end of the lake. And I, I think there have been readings or uh, measurements done there before by volunteers that found higher numbers than this. So I don't want to say that they're what they're finding is not right is not true. This is just one of our measurements and it's one time measurement, but we did. We actually have the lowest readings of anything there. Um, and then I just want to sort of distinguish between the concentrations here and loading. So concentrations are what you actually measure. You send the sample off to the lab and say, well, what's in this? But the loading is really what's the most important thing, because that's what's telling you what's actually going into the lake. That's actually the rate of what's going into the lake. So if you have a source that has that's loading a lot, it's going to give you more issues with the lake than a source that's dirty but not contributing a lot of water. So that site two outfall, based on the flow measurements that we took at the time, is actually creating the most loading of phosphorus and nitrogen, even though the actual concentrations were uh, lower there, just because um, more there's volume. more volume. It's coming all off the road there. Something to keep in mind. Switch it to the next slide. Let's see if my screen catches up. <laughs> there we go. All right, now on to the groundwater results. Um, so here's where loading comes into play too. So we had the, the highest concentrations at groundwater three and groundwater two, which are like the south and western side of the lake for phosphorus. And the highest nitrogen concentrations were at GW4, which is pictured here, which is just south of the town beach. And actually lowest at GW2, which is the western side of the lake. That would be the closest to the septics as opposed to undeveloped. Right, right. yeah, GW2 is kind of, I mean, there's houses over there, and there's, there, and it is, there is development in the watershed, but, but not less dense than over here, yeah. Um, so we found, uh, Nitrogen mainly again in the form of ammonia here. Uh, we had over a milligram per liter of places. We didn't really see any nitrate coming in through the water quality or the uh, groundwater. So it wasn't detectable at 0.02 milligrams per liter. And that comes into play later on this slide here. But um, looking at the loading, so not just the concentrations, the actual loading rate for both nitrogen and phosphorus was highest at the GW4 site, which is why I've kind of zoomed in on it here. 
And that's because we had the highest seepage rates there. So you got the most groundwater flow coming in, plus you had pretty high results. Um, it just means that's that's where more of that stuff was coming in. That said, compared to what was coming in through the surface water, the time that we measured it during wet weather flow actually isn't that much. Um, isn't there a small stream coming down in the right? Maybe that's just a channel. Outflow. It's an outflow. An outflow. From the lake. Goes under Kinsey Lane. Goes right too far though, right? It's not connected to anything. There's a wetland down behind. Uh, I remember when we had a house there that we, we, yeah. we went with the Shang Wang uh, on Millville Road. Benny Pinto had that house we were building. Oh, that flow there. Yeah. Like the yeah. Which way does that flow? You're saying? It goes behind that house. Yeah. It goes, it goes south. So you're saying in high water that there's a second outflow of Lake Nima? You go out that way? Yeah, whether, never, it's, whether it's high water or if travel. I don't think it goes very far. It goes into that wetland there. Yeah, it goes to a low area, a little bit lower than the, the shoreline. It's a small little pipe that goes under the road there right by farm or something. So. I guess another thing to, to mention here is that aside from that seat that emerges near the shoreline at site five or by the yacht club and the dry weather pipe flow at site four, you know, we were kind of keeping our eyes peeled for any sign of like septic issues that were obvious to the eye uh, as we went around the lake. We really didn't see any other spots where there was an obvious sign of something that could be coming into the lake that would be septic related just visually. I mean, one of the things we did the sampling is to go beyond just visual, obviously. But we were also looking for those visual signs. Um, we didn't really find any other spots where we thought there would be potential, uh, you know, breakouts or anything like that. That's possible. That's a positive story. Yeah. And again, during the seasons, you know, that could change. Mm -hmm. So as the water table goes up and down, you may have spots that become problematic. But when we were out there, we just didn't, we didn't see it in those two places. I mean, fortunately, that a lot of the residents, residential homes on the lake have been upgraded to either tight tanks or if they have the room for a septic system, they do have an updated septic system. Um, felt like it was years ago when they were cottages. I'm sure there was stuff running. Yeah. But there's still cesspools on the lake. Oh, there is, yes. There's nine. Oh, well, someone's counting. Oh, that's good. Where to help me? Unfortunately, I got to sneak out here. Uh, sorry, guys. Wow. So, this is only the tight tanks are because it's just not enough to put in the full. Right. Because yeah, these are pretty tight lots for these. So, um, so one of the things we're supposed to do on this uh, um, project was also look at stable isotope analysis. And this is kind of a whole different level of things. So, basically, we would allow to say, where is the nitrogen in the nitrate? Is it coming from fertilizer? Is it coming from septic waste? Is it something else? But you need a certain level of nitrate in the water to be able to test that. We just didn't have enough. So we sent to the lab and just said, hey, can you guys try to get this? And they, they couldn't get us results. So unfortunately, it wasn't dirty enough to, <laughs> yeah. to help us. That's the good news, I guess. Now, if you took a sample straight from like septic system, you would you definitely have enough, um, but then, then you know your answer already, so you don't really need to do that, right? Um, so unfortunately, we didn't we didn't get the chance to do that. Um, I think that would be a very helpful thing to do if we were able to find a spot where we really had a consistent um, slug of nit nitrate coming in specifically. Um, we we just never find happened in a wet weather event. Is that your best chance to get that? Well, we really wanted to get it during uh, our groundwater sampling because we want to actually look at what was coming in the groundwater since that's really where the septic influence sure. would be right and so we pumped a lot of groundwater you don't really know what you're getting until you send it to the lab and then no we didn't have that much nitrogen we had nitrogen just not in the right form uh, a few other observations to note um, we had fish kill reported on june 8th that was actually actually when we were out there um it's coincidental we saw a few fish and then we got a call or a an email later from Ann and Dan, you might have chimed in on this too, that there, was other, there were other residents around the lake reporting dead fish. I think it was mostly um, sunfish, 
whether it's perch and maybe even a bass or something. Um, this wasn't as bad as years ago, or was this? It was a lot less this year. For some reason, and in the fall, it was a lot less beats that were on the lake. For some reason, they didn't uh, come up like they usually do. Usually, we have like 150 beats that mm -hmm. land in the fall of the year. Yeah, so we, we didn't really see a whole bunch of geese uh, at any one time, but you know they're around. Uh, and then we actually collected the phytoplankton samples. That's just algae in, in the lake water suspended on September 13th. And we did find cyanobacteria there, but it was at sub low density. So we found a few thousand cells per milliliter. The you know the threshold for the state is 70,000. So we were well below that. Um, but again, present and it's to be expected, and you know, cyanobacteria pretty much grows everywhere. You just don't want it to get to bloom densities because then you could have issues with cyanotoxins. Would um, that tend to happen in the more shallow areas, like in the cove first? Before I th so that's one of the concerns I have, is that if you have a fish kill like this, which was normally in town beach and towards that cove, if you don't have a good circulation to that cove you, and you have the right um, circumstances, water quality wise, Weather-wise, you could end up with a bloom that starts there and it gets maybe really bad there. You don't see it across the lake, and it can cause issues there. Um, and then we also apparently had, you know, we didn't get this directly. But Dan said that there were some complaints of uh, not confirmed. I don't think swimmers itch-like symptoms. People having a rash after they went swimming. Um, so if it is swimmers itch, um, that's it's a parasite. But it's actually a parasite that can't affect humans, believe it or not. And so the rash is um, just an allergy to the organism trying to get in your skin, but not being able to succeed. Um, so some people develop it, some people don't. So some people can swim in with that stuff around and don't develop an issue, and others are itchy for a while. Um, but it is something that can build up in lakes, uh, particularly areas that don't have great circulation. It's a parasite that has its primary host is actually snails that live in the lake. And then the secondary host is waterfowl, so that's how it comes around place to place. Yeah. Is it enough complaint that it's impacting the it just not? I mean, it just seemed like more than you know, see the best. not yeah, you know, five or six, not a hundred, but I mean, you know, it just seemed like it came up this summer more than it has in the past. And that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with the lake, like I said, it's a Natural parasitic organism that lives out there. If you have a lot of waterfowl, a lot of snails, so though, <laughs> since those are the hosts, could have issues, recurring issues with that particular organism. So, I'm going to show you some options for management going forward. And I just want to kind of give you a summary of what our key factors were to consider in doing all this. So, one, Lake Nimbuck is a pretty moderately shallow lake. It's super deep and it has some stratification in the summertime so the cool bottom water and the warm surface water don't really mix that much in the summertime so that tells us one thing two the northernmost cove which is that shallow cove has limited exchange with the rest of the lake uh, especially during low water this could be a problem you get blooms low dissolved oxygen and resulting fish kills um, that sort of thing that may start there um, it also provides shelter for aquatic invasive plants if you're not after them, uh, that's like the kind of it's a perfect kind of spot for those to really take hold. Well, we didn't find a whole lot of aquatic invasive plants in the lake. They're present, but they weren't extensive at the time of survey, so that's good. Um, and we also found that surface water inputs are likely to contribute the majority of the flow to the lake based on the measurements that we made. Um, it's limited evidence, but suggests that we need to look farther further at stormwater outfalls and direct runoff from those sources. Um, the groundwater issue, septic issue, and waterfowl probably also are contributors, but they may not be major contributors. But that doesn't mean that they can't be important contributors. To this. If those slugs and nutrients or bacteria come in at the right time of the year, it can cause a problem. Um, and by right time of the year, it's usually mid to late summer. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, that internal recycling of phosphorus, the release from the sediments, may also be a problem during summer and fall. Again, a sensitive time of the year. 
And finally, swimmer's itch. Um, it's a nuisance to sensitive individuals that we talked about um, participate in swimming. Uh, so it's just something to sort of keep in mind and make your recommendations. There's a lot of things that could be done. We're not going to cover all these. <laughs> um, in fact, all those things that are on the right hand side, other options, those are just things for you to know that are out there. And that's not even an exhaustive li list. I try to keep the list on the left uh, short and focus on things that are most likely to be appropriate for linking them up or things that you're already doing. And so we'll kind of take a closer look at some of those now. So this next table, which will pop up in a second here, it's just kind of summarizes what the different issues are that each of these options addresses. So, um, and I'll describe each of these a little bit later, but aeration of circulation, is just kind of what it sounds like, moving the water around or pumping air or oxygen into it. That's gonna help you with algae issues, depending on what you do and how you do it, it could help with bacteria and nutrients, and then other pollutants that could help with, or definitely will help with dissolved oxygen. So if you're moving, if you're adding air to the lake, you're probably gonna get in front of dissolved oxygen. Uh, second line, algicides, it's right in the name. You use that for algae, it doesn't really give you anything on anything else. Uh, benthic barriers, this is a barrier you put down on the bottom of the lake. Uh, that's really for control of plant growth in local spots. I put a question mark under other because technically you could use it to smother snails. Uh, that would be probably pretty difficult to uh, convince everybody it was a good idea. If you had a big problem with summer's itch and you knew it was coming from the snails, it could be a, a side effect that could be uh, contemplated. Um, harvesting, this is really the most direct way to control plants. So stuff at the surface, you can pull out by hand. The stuff that's growing below the water surface, you can dive and do it essentially. You can remove some nutrients doing that, but really with the amount of nutrients in the plant versus what's in the sediment is minimal. So you're not removing a lot. So I kind of call that a question mark. Definitely it's a great way to control plants, especially if it's just small infestations. And you may get some other benefits too, like improved circulation so that you can prevent um, the buildup of those organisms that call it cause swimmer's niche. Herbicides, which you guys are familiar with, that's really just to control plants. Again, if you get some control of plants, maybe you get some improvement in water movement and other things, water exchange that might uh, help you with the swimmer sedge issue. Uh, nutrient inactivation, this is actually going in and tying up the phosphorus, adding something that binds the phosphorus to it. And so that will sort of address phosphorus issues up with other nutrients. Um, but depending on how it's applied, it may actually strip algae from the water pond too. So that's another way it could be used. Wouldn't reduced nutrients improve the plant issue? Or probably not for the rooted plants. Okay. They're getting most of their nutrients from the the, so the sediment. So they'll still be able to extract that. So you can't inactivate sediment nutrients. You can, but it may not go deep enough. <laughs> and Biology is also pretty good at mining that, so even if you did that, plants would have a way to get at that. What you'd really be trying to do is lock it up so that just the chemical reactions wouldn't happen that would release the plant. So how do you achieve nutrient inactivation? I'll show you in a couple oh, sorry, slides. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then resident waterfowl controls, these are just passive or active measures that you can take to prevent uh, or reduce the number of waterfowl hanging out around the pond or a lake over the summertime. So it helps with bacteria, nutrients, and pollutants. And then there's beyond the in-lake end of things, there's also watershed improvements that can be made. Uh, septic system improvements that we already kind of talked about happening that helps you control your bacteria and nutrient issues. And sperm improvements, bacteria, nutrients, other pollutants like salts and benefits, organics, and that sort of thing. And then finally, a few other options I think we should be considering here monitoring it's not a management action um, but you don't know where you're at unless you're tracking it so it helps you evaluate whether the management from the point of play is actually working whether you want to tweak it at all um, it also helps you find problems early on um, and then public education and outreach can really help you address all of these things to a certain degree so i kind of put that across the board so it's just kind of a summary table to show you where we go with this that we, we can cover all the bases just using these options. Um, so I won't go into too much detail on this, but aeration and circulation, pretty basically, you're mixing or you're introducing air or oxygen, trying to physically mix it or to actually get the atmospheric um, air or oxygen into the water. 
or you're just putting air directly into it. Um, either way, you get more aeration in the water column. If it's done correctly, you can control cyanobacteria growth through one more mechanisms, uh, making it too dark basically for the for the algae. If they keep getting pushed to the bottom of the pond by uh, a circulator, they won't be able to photosynthesize very well, so then they die. You might, if you add more oxygen, you'll be more effective at binding phosphorus in the sediments, so you won't have as much phosphorus in the water column. So that could be good. Um, you could also use it to encourage circulation in the second coves, like the cove we have in the north. So you find that at certain times of the year you've got problems uh, that are related to stagnant water issues. Circulation might help you um, address some of those. Costs are really kind of all over the place depending on the volume that you want to circulate and what the tech is that you're using. The good things here we can improve dissolved oxygen, enhance phosphorus removal, uh, reduce nuisance algae growth, and we have a few negative impacts to non target species. In fact, some impacts are good. The drawbacks, things to consider, are that you've got to have a power supply. Uh, there's some solar power operations, but they usually are underpowered, so probably you have to pay for power and you're going to have to have electrical available. And you also need to maintain the equipment, obviously. And then finally, it's kind of difficult to achieve success at large scales with this. Um, so it's really more something that works, works for improving water quality in the local spot in the lake, not in the um, Next up is algicides. Again, this is really simple. It kills the algae. Mostly co uh, copper-based formulations, but there's others too that are you know, hydrogen peroxide or something else. Pretty low cost, very effective for the short term, but the algae can grow right back. Uh, the nutrients are still there. That's, that's pretty much the, uh, the skinny on algae sites. Benthic barrier system is what I was mentioning before. It's really just a sheet that you put on the bottom, uh, negatively buoyant, so it kind of sits on the bottom, actually smothers all the aquatic plant growth. Bad thing about that is you don't control which plants you're smothering, so nothing can grow through this. Um, also, as I mentioned before, if you have invertebrates that are on the bottom, They'll also get squished by this uh, if they can't get out from underneath it. Um, so there are potential impacts to non-target organisms, but the area that would impact would be low because you wouldn't put these things across the entire lake. You really just use them for shallow areas where you're trying to access the lake or something in the boating. Um, you would or around docks, that sort of thing. You really wouldn't go out in the middle of the lake. So I think um, from that perspective, if you were to use something like this, the overall impacts of the lake would be pretty minimal and pretty easy to mitigate, um, especially if you're using them to control exotic plants and not use chemicals in those areas that might be a worthwhile trade-off. Hand harvesting is great for water chestnut. That's, as long as it's not dense, that's the best way to get rid of it. Um, once it gets dense, you either have to do mechanical harvesting or herbicides to get rid of it, and that's a lot harder. So I would encourage you uh, and the community around the Knipnuk to keep up, keep their eye on the water chestnut and keep it at bay um, so that it never gets so bad that it can't just be hand harvested. Um, we can also use this for pioneer infestations of new species or to control remnant areas like we were seeing for the milk oils, um, but obviously you have to do it with divers. Divers are usually Think about what you can weed in your own backyard in a day. If you're pulling it all by hand, make some of the complication of having to do it underwater. You're not, you're not going to get an acre a day unless you have very, very sparse growth. Um, so it's a long process. It can be kind of costly. That's why it's really best applied to those spots where you have a discrete bed that you just, you know, say you had something the size of uh, this area of the tank area that you wanted to get rid of before it spread anywhere else. Divers might be able to do that for you. Herbicides, I think you guys are familiar with this. Um, you know, one big advantage is there's a wide variety of them. They have different modes of action, different formulations, you can control all kinds of different plants. You can use contact or systemic herbicides. The contacts just kill the tissues that are exposed. The systemic kill the whole plant. You can use selective herbicides just to target one or two species. You can use broad spectrum to kill a bunch of them if you have a problem with a bunch of different species. So there's a lot of options here. Um, and they're very cost effective for large areas, which makes them a uh, tool that's often gone to for monitoring to extensive infestations. But obviously, there's uh, you know, some things to consider when using herbicides. There's, there could be water use restrictions, 
thing on the label. Um, if you eat off the plants really quickly and it's larger, you could have dissolved oxygen sag, which could cause other problems. You could get a fish kill potentially if you're not careful. Um, don't really see that a lot in Massachusetts just because they're pretty careful with how they do the applications and the labels are pretty prescriptive, but <laughs> it could happen if somebody was reckless. Um, there could be resistance that's developed in some populations for target species. So if you keep applying the same herbicide over and over again, eventually you may have um, individuals of that species that are resistant come to make up the majority of the population in the lake. And then you can't use that herbicide anymore because it won't be effective. So you got to watch out for that and make sure that you're uh, rotating if you have that op option or using an herbicide that's not known to easily de um, develop resistance in plants. And then there could be some impacts on non-target organisms. Um, most of these really probably are, you know, from plant dieback, you kind of lose some habitat there. The idea though being if you're really trying to control the invasives, the plants will grow in as the season progresses, there will be a more habitat available that way. Um, so it's not like you're totally losing things, you're not going to swing pool characteristics, but you're just kind of shifting the community. All right, so now we're on to nutrient inactivation. This is kind of just a brief description of what that is. So usually you would use aluminum sulfate, also known as alum, uh, but there's other compounds that could be used as well. And there's different application strategies. Um, there's stripping, which is really designed to clean up the water column. So let's say you have a bad algae bloom every year, you know you're going to have it, and you wait to see when that hits, and then you go out and you, you hit it with alum. The alum will actually pull all those particulates and cells out of the water column, and it'll also control some of the phosphorus in the water column and give you a nice clear lake. It might not be for that long. Uh, it might be, depending on the year and the conditions, but it's really just designed to sort of quickly strip the water. Column. Is that once and done, or it's just going to break up and become available? It depends on the, um, well, it depends on the situation. So if you're Situation is very predictable. You know you're going to have an algae bloom in June. There's actually another thing you can do too, which is the maintenance treatment. The stripping is slightly different in that you use it specifically to get stuff out of the water column. So it's more of a reactive uh, approach, whereas the maintenance dosing is more of a proactive <laughs> approach where you say, you know we're going to have an issue this year if we don't uh, control some of the phosphorus. We're going to go out and do a low dose in June, then they will do another in July, and that should keep us algae free, uh, at least bloom free for the rest of the season. And is this over the extent of the entire pond, or it doesn't move around that much, or you do it in selected areas? Well, if you're doing the stripping, it would be wherever you want that, that water clarity. So usually it would be the whole pond, um, but let's say you just had a problem in Northern Cove where you kept getting issues with water clarity due to Cell growth, you can focus your just there using this. Um, and then the sediment dosing, I think, is what you were uh, asking about before. That's really sort of more of an intensive, high dose treatment. It requires a lot of planning, design to make sure that you're getting the right dose. And then that actually is designed to not to go through the water column and pull stuff out of that, but to lock set of phosphorus up in the sediments. And it has its design depth that you uh, target. So let's say you know most of the available phosphorus comes from the top 10 centimeters of the setup. You can actually design your dose to treat that top 10 centimeters. That's most effective in deep lakes, um, where we know that internal recycling is a big portion of the total phosphorus load for the year. It probably would be less effective in a lake like this, or if you didn't really have an internal recycling problem. It would be something that you want to do. Um, it's pretty expensive. Uh, so, like sediment dosing for a lake the size of Lake Nipah would be several hundred thousand dollars. I don't think we will get it. But the stripping and maintenance treatments might be more affordable. It depends on how you want to budget things out and if you need it at all. But I'm just kind of saying this is an option for doing that if, if it's something that needs to be done in the future. The good thing here is when you actually look at how you much phosphorus to remove, it's very low compared to. Other things that you might do in the watershed, you know, you might spend a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars building stormwater uh, improvements that get you a fraction of what you would get in something like this. So it's always sort of a cost benefit analysis that should be done. 
And then the next thing, resident waterfowl controls. So this, this could be as simple as goose fencing, just to keep geese from coming up on the, the beach into your yard. It could be plantings to keep them from doing that. Um, it could be active harassment of the geese to keep them from staying in the area. Usually that just shifts them to your neighbor's pond. So <laughs> uh, I guess depending on how much you like your neighbors, uh, that could be an option. Reduced mowing is an easy thing to do. It doesn't totally keep the geese away, but they tend to like being on the lawns that are most closely cropped because that's the nicest stuff that you chew on. The longer the lawn, the less likely they are to hang out in that spot. Um, and also having more grass there slows down the water. It prevents a lot of the stuff that's in the goose poop from running into the pond. So it traps, the, traps those nutrients a little bit better and keeps them on the land instead of in the water. So that's another reason why that might be a good approach. And there's a whole list of other things that could be done that I won't get into the detail about. But uh, obviously, if you guys are interested in exploring this more, lots of resources out there to do that. And then lastly, the, uh, the watershed controls. So the septic system improvements, these could be simple repairs, upgrades, more frequent maintenance. Could be also be regulatory changes to town level, uh, depending on uh, you know, what, what the, the sentiment is about doing that, requiring uh, certain things. Um, but there's different ways of going about it. Basically, you're trying to get rid of excessive nutrients and bacteria that might get septic systems. Um, this is a great approach in areas where septic systems are dominant. It takes time and implement and money. And even if you did it all right away, again, there's there's already some septic load in the soils that it's going to make it into the lake. So even if you stopped it all right now, you'd still have more leaching of that coming into the lake over the next few years. So it doesn't make the problem go away right away, but it is something good to do long. Kind of the same idea with stormwater improvements, costly, you gotta site them right, design them right. Uh, some of these could be incorporated into any new developments, so requiring low impact development techniques to be used, adding green infrastructure. Um, if you have particular problem spots, you could retrofit those and reduce the load of nutrients and sediments into the lake. Um, again, you could also include regulatory changes, so town bylaws and um, regulations of those bylaws could be altered to be more strict. All kinds of different ways you can make this happen in the watershed. Um, but it does offer the advantage of being able to control a lot of different things that are coming from the watershed, not just necessarily nutrients or bacteria, but um, other things as well. So uh, definitely something to keep in mind for watershed improvements, but it takes time and a lot of money. And it's not maintained, it won't work. <laughs> That's the other thing with strong water controls. Uh, public outreach, education. Um, always recommended, really, uh, the more people understand, the more they can become advocates for water quality and keep the lakes in good shape. Uh, could be anything from informational kiosks at the, uh, at the public access areas, social media postings that this town would do, or the Lake Association could have workshops to train people up on how to identify exotic plants, um, how to build rain gardens, all kinds of different stuff. Um, Typically, even if you had a really good education and outreach program, probably not going to see more than five to ten percent reduction just for those behavioral changes that happen. But it does bring the community more into the loop you know, with what's happening and how what they do affects water quality. So definitely something we always recommend. And then monitoring, as I said before, you can detect, detect problems often early. Uh, you can identify trends that are happening in the lake. Um, so you don't have to rely on people saying, well, 20 years ago, I remember being this, you actually have the data. Um, and it's actually necessary for a successful uh, evolution and optimization of your management program. So if you don't know what your management program is achieving, you can't, and you don't measure it, you don't really know what the best way is to change it going forward to be responsive to what you need to do. Um, and monitoring programs can be sized to your budget, or they can be scaled to the needs, depending on uh, the funds you have available to you and what your goals are. Uh, but it should be really a part of every management program. So finally, getting to what's, what's next. Um, there's a lot of options here, and our report is going to describe these. I think a lot of them are applicable, but obviously there needs to be more discussion and some data gaps built in before you decide what's really the best way to go about this. 
there's some that are already being implemented to work with you. That's great. Um, I still think it would be a good idea to have a strategy for how you implement those over the long term and where you really want to go with your lake management activities. So a lake or watershed management plan would allow you to find those goals, fill those data gaps, select the prioritized management actions you want to advance, and then set a timeline of budget and implementation. And most importantly, it's a good tool to allow you to go pursue funding. So a lot of the grants that are out there, you don't have a plan to get them already. You can't just go and ask for money and get it. You have to have something in hand. So this will kind of this kind of provides the steps of what you want to do, how much it's going to cost, and allows you to go for something. Um, so that's another reason why it's a good idea. And then you can monitor your progress and adjust and optimize the plan over time. It really should be a living topic. And finally, this is really uh, where I'll end tonight and, and obviously open up to questions. I just wanted to give you guys some ideas of funding sources that are out there, technical assistance sources. Um, probably already aware of many of these. If not, uh, let's go through them a little bit. So MassDEP has uh, Clean Water Act grants through Section 604B and 319. They're different. So the 604B grants, they're very competitive. There's no match required, though. But they have to be used for water and assessment. So you're looking at where are our pollutant sources coming from. Um, they can be used to plan for how you're going to address those. They can be used to develop concept designs. And that's about as far as you go with the 604B grants. They tend to be thirty to fifty thousand dollars in that range. 319 non-point source grants can be much bigger. In fact, they are, they're almost never that low. They're usually closer to seventy-five hundred to two hundred. $300,000. Um, but you get that after you already have the plan in place. Um, those are really for designing, permitting, and implementing your plan. Um, MassDP does have a relatively new monitoring grant program that came out two three years ago, uh, just specifically for nonprofits who want to do water quality monitoring and have them, the data be of the quality that would be necessary to be accepted by MassDP. Uh, so that's definitely something that uh, volunteers could do. And I don't know, you guys may already be participating in it, perhaps through Blackstone. Yes. Yeah. So the River Coalition. Yeah. What was that? Like some River Coalition, the Nimbuck Association hired. So I think I think some of their funding may come through that grant. And then there's the Community Preservation Act, which is local and has state match. Um, it's obviously subject to the goals and local uh, committee. So uh, typically we see lake projects come to the open space or recreation categories. Uh, but they can't be for maintaining anything, so you can't use them to knock back, you can't use them for herbicide projects. Um, but you might be able to uh, get funding for that to look into doing something else um, and maybe coming up with designs for that, that program that you want to have. Um, and the Southeast New England program, which gets federal funding, has both a grant program and they also have a technical assistance um, program through the network. So the technical assistance program really offers uh, free training to assistance to uh, municipalities and other groups for stormwater and watershed management, ecological restoration projects, and climate resilience. And the SNAP grant program actually funds big projects. Um, and those uh, grants tend to come out most years now in the past, I believe, were not as active as they are now. So it's a great time to be looking for funding. There's a lot more sources out there than they used to be. Um, and since you're in the Narragansett Bay watershed, you would qualify if you were in the SNAP region, essentially. So uh, it is available to you. And then lastly, and there's other um, programs, but I didn't want to put too many in here, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Action Grants. Those were actually implementing things that are identified in those MVP plans to address climate change impacts. Um, like Nipmuc is definitely going to be impacted by climate change. So there's lots of potential there. Um, perhaps getting a grant effect. I'm aware of other lakes and ponds that have gotten MVP grants, action grants, to work on issues at their lake to make their lake more resilient to climate change. So something else to consider there. I know that was a lot, but we did a lot for you guys. So I <laughs> make sure you, you saw, you know, the, got the gist of our results and what your options are and open up to questions. Thank you for your time.
Um, in previous years, there's been a beaver problem with beaver dams blocking the outflow in Pony Brook. Did you observe any issues with beavers or things that beavers may have caused problems? Other than very high water levels. Uh, not specifically this year. I'm not saying it wasn't there. I just don't know. I don't know that we saw that. Somebody in the room will wear whether the beavers are still active down there. They are active, but not as good as you because there was traffic last year. Okay. Can you just end your screen share? Yes. Just so people, then people will see the video in the room. So I'm thinking of that uh, channel alongside the beach and the high bacteria. And then hearing that the DPW had to clean out the vegetation at the end. And isn't it a place that people can bring boats into? I just imagine a place down high ends. There's a nice little walk with a recreated wetland along the edge. And it's, a, it's an amenity, but it's also kind of a, an enhancement. Well, so it's interesting you mentioned that. We are in the process of trying to come to CONCOM for the work being done at the beach. Um, Alan ended up doing just cleaning out the path for the fire because they had a drill. But I believe the plan is to come with with some sort of we have more energy or on some of that to you know to clean up the beach area. Because I'm not sure if there's an opportunity. The fire department was looking for places of emergency water, which arguably couldn't that be a, a win win that by dredging out, cleaning out the vegetation in some spot that would allow uh, the fire to draft. It might improve the vegetation or the dangerous road to go down. Could I mean, I think it's definitely a possibility. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't think it's a dangerous road to go down. Uh, it really depends on what you're, I guess there's conflicts of uses for that area and not knowing enough about the specific project that you're talking about. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's a historically been an access path so an Eagle Scout cleaned it up and, and then another one did a bunch of work and then they realized it would provide an avenue for fire. Now we actually have an Eagle Scout that built kayak racks for us um, that aren't out yet. So there's more coming, I think, to that. So I just see it. Alan just did some quick repair. It's really the only public access if the beach is closed. You, it, is the, it is intended to be the public access point. And I think technically this is a great pond. That's where we put our boat in. So right. <laughs> um, so could have, and so then I see it could be cleaned up, and it's more public education. But could you also say no? You're actually doing some good, but uh, it's a highly, it's a more visible location, and maybe a more effective thing way off in the cove that you never see. It. Yeah, it's probably a good place to at least have that interaction with the public one way or another, and talk about what you're doing, whether it's. Sign saying, hey, this project was done to improve water quality and access. And it's probably a good spot, a good visible spot to do that. Um, and there's definitely, you know, depending on where you guys want to go with this, there's other ways that the access could be improved that might reduce issues with you know, erosion or the ponding in the future. Um, so. I don't suppose the neighborhood wants to really develop too too much, right? It's not as if we want okay. to. So it's keeping it limited. Yeah, I would be interested, and I don't know if this is allowed, if you could do some, you know, get some crushed stone or something to get a little bit of separation from the area and the actual swimming area. And I'm not sure what the technical term is, but if you went out, of, you know, five or ten feet with, with you know, some sort of material. If that would help them to keep the water going one way to segregate to kind of, the water yeah, I, I don't know if it's helpful to see that storm water getting out into the lake versus ending up once it hits the lake the though, issue, I don't know. Yeah. does it move or yeah, it's, yeah the physical barrier some of the tss or something might drop out but you probably still have a lot dissolved stuff coming in and i think from our concern i mean from parks you know, these i and they seem to be out of the blue we get any coli failure and shuts the beach down and it's a PR problem. So I think anything we can do to address that, you know, and I guess it sounds like you know, you do not find any major signs of you know septic problems. At least. No, but I mean I think you know if there have been upgrades and 
the area, but I'm pretty sure that not everybody's either on a tight tank that's regularly maintained or has an adequate septic system. There's, I mean, there's very few places where everybody's up to stuff. So, and even if they are, there's still going to be loading that comes in through those through the ground from functional septic systems. Um, the tight tanks not so much, but the other stuff yes. So. Those are legitimate sources. How important they are to the lake is hard to really determine without, you know, a little more study and possibly some modeling to see how they actually work and how they may fuel, you know, algal growth in the pond or something like that. Um, but that's 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 a bigger uh, not to crack. So the phosphorus that might be historic that's there and could be problematic. It could be. Animal poop, dog waste, it could be leaves blowing in. There's no one culprit we can point our finger to. For the bacteria specifically? Or run off from the street in sediments. I'm just thinking where the potential source is for phosphorus. For phosphorus? For phosphorus. For phosphorus. Uh, all those are potential so sources. I think based on what we found, it's likely that stormwater is a major source for this lake. Whether it's a problematic source, it's hard to say at this point, it's not enough information, but it seems to be one, it's likely to be one of the bigger sources. And Especially those drain direction. outfalls as opposed to a neighbor's well, yard. It includes but, both, I think. Um, especially <laughs> in, in a spot like this where you don't have, you know, you don't, you're not, you don't have a bunch of sand and gravel underneath the topsoil, it's bedrock or Till. It just means that you're going to saturate really quickly and um, may generate a lot of runoff from the watershed, and some of it may just come directly into the lake. We worked in another lake that had just one stormwater uh, like uh, structure coming into the lake, but the rest of the lake had lots of direct input because the slopes are so steep. And so anything you did that took out the understory in the forest basically exposed those slopes to erosion. And even though there was no pollutant source, so to speak, um, just the the sand and soil coming off that slope and going into the pond was actually enough phosphorus loading to cause problems. So maybe even work further than say 50 or 100 feet away if it's on the slope that will migrate. Yeah, I think the priority for like the direct runoff would be very close into the lake, but you could extend it farther out, and then definitely any. Stormwater that comes in a more organized fashion, either channelized or through a pipe, has definitely lots of opportunities to improve water quality there. Or reduce the volume of stormwater that comes through. Infiltration may not be that great because if you don't have a place to put it, but there's other things you can do to at least cut down on that. So you're pretty much done, right? So you're going to submit a final report, or is that? That's the next step, yeah. And it'll be based on. You know, this presentation will have a lot more detail because um, we'll actually have all the data in there for you. And I kind of summarized a lot in here. Um, but that's that's coming next. Well, thank you for your work. Does so, anybody have any other questions? Or? Um, the variety in the testing results for Site 5, from volunteer results, testing, and then comparing what you took, is that just the quality of testing? Like how, how can you explain the difference in the results? Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know off the top of my head what the values were that they were getting. I just know that there were descriptions that there were problems there, um, past testing. So, I, no, I don't think it's a quality thing. I, I, don't, I think any sampling that was done there before, I have no reason to think that it wasn't, as, you know, it's not. I just think when we went out, it, there was, there was phosphorus, there was nitrogen, but there wasn't a lot compared to other. More comparative. Because yeah, historically, I feel like Site 5 and the Town Beach have the highest bacteria rates, but then it seems like your testing shows the Town Beach is much more than Site 5. But like, the results are usually pretty significant in the areas we don't get tested. Yeah, no, I mean, for this run, it was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ideally, when you're doing wet weather testing, yeah, if you have the budget to do it, you'd want to collect multiple samples during a single event and have, have you know, collected simultaneously. 
for the very reason I described before, you start off kind of getting dirtier water right away and you know, when you have the main event starting to fall and you start generating runoff. And then as you generate runoff longer and longer, you have less and less, the concentration goes down to basically you know, the first flush of all the pollutants into the pond and then the water gets a little cleaner after that, it's just raining on the ground that's already, you've already kind of moved that, the pollutants away. So it'd be nice to know what that curve was, but then you have to go out multi, you know, sample multiple times. It's something that a volunteer organization, if they have the materials to do, and especially if they live very close by, it could easily do and would provide useful information, I think, for understanding how these storms evolve. And that, excuse me, how we have more comparable results too. You know, ours, we were doing it at three sites, different parts of the storm, you know, we have a person going around sampling these three different places. So it wasn't exactly the same point in the storm at each of those spots. If you had a volunteer force, you could have somebody standing at each spot. We could do it too, it just costs cost us to do it and probably doesn't make a lot. It's not cost effective for the town problems. So how many samples do you take through the whole summer? Um, well, there's one round of dry weather and one round of wet weather. Those are three each. Okay, so there's two, three, three samples. That's, that's six samples total there, right? For the whole summer. For the whole summer, for the stuff coming in, service water coming in to the lake. When, when I was negotiating a slope of work with them back in like January, February, March, sampling is expensive. So given the amount of SCT money that we had to work with, that's how we ended up with the amount of sampling that we had. And we took the feedback that we got from our introductory meeting and that adjusted the sampling. So we also had the round of in-lake sampling that um, we went on did another Around in lake uh, measurements, not lab sampling, but measurements. And then, of course, the groundwater sampling. So there were four sites for the groundwater. How often should a test like this take place? You mean like an assessment like this? Yeah. Ideally, uh, when, you're, when you're doing the diagnostics, you probably want to do something like it would be nice to get the groundwater sampling in multiple seasons, just so you can see how it varies over the seasons. Um, but you don't, that's not something that you can do very often. So you might make a concerted push on the front end of, of what you're doing to sort of figure out, you know, what's groundwater really contributing. And then once you've got a handle on it, go about developing a plan and implementing that plan. And maybe you come back and visit five or 10 years down the road and see if you're getting the results that you want. Um, but for like the, the end link stuff, that's something that would be very valuable to have every year. Um, even if you just have the septic test readings, which again, volunteers can very easily do at the monthly over the course of the summertime, that would be great if you have a data set showing water transparency in the lake at a given spot over multiple years, you know, without too much effort. So. Well, if we're going to continue hiring someone, I'm assuming, to do herbicides to handle the weeds. Don't they often do some testing pre and post? And can we kind of get a better bang for the buck in hiring them to, hey, while you're at it, to check the phosphorus or something, even though it's not specifically what they're testing for? But if they're going to be out there anyways. Kind of There's two different things. Sending water samples to a lab takes big bucks. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about when you take black and white disc and drop it down, right. that's, that's that something right. volunteers can do. Or we can definitely have them do it when they're they're applying herbicides in the How much does it take to send a sample for phosphorus to the lab? 100 bucks? 100 bucks? It's more the labor of getting the sample, right? The labor is for a single sample, yeah, the labor is more. Um, but it's still, you know, like depending on which lab you use, probably looking at somewhere between 20 and 30 bucks. For a single phosphorus sample. Yeah, so and if you start getting dissolved phosphorus as well, or or if you want to get all the different kinds of nitrogen, then you start yeah. starts adding up. The bacteria samples are not inexpensive, obviously. I think, I think the board of health pays for what we're doing. I think it's over a hundred dollars, but a lot of that is the chlorine fee. And they need to use a state certified laboratory and things like that. I mean, personally, I would love to see if there was a way to in house or get some 
do some of the smaller scale testing at home. It looked like you could purchase certain equipment that could do that. Yeah, just for monitoring, not right. for uh, yeah, know, like health or anything. You're yeah. still going to do your testing, but just kind of. It sounds like from what you see, you know, it's so I know like we struggled with a lot of erosion issues and runoff at the beach in general, some of which we're trying to fix. But it sounds like anything like keeping an eye on that stormwater that's an area of concern, potentially contributing to some of these issues. Yep. I guess I'm just a little concerned about where we go from here. Yeah, right. so I mean, now we got this going. Okay. To, actually, that's the question I wanted to ask us. My conclusion from listening to your presentation is that there's no red flags. There's nothing that we absolutely have to get done, like the first thing we heard earlier in the meeting, that the lake is in reasonably good shape. So that means that the next thing we want to do is create that kind of management plan that we were talking about the second to last time. The advantage of having that plan in place is then we can go and ask for the larger grants. We did we got this presentation for under twenty thousand dollars. There are two what I'm hearing, there are two different levels of grants. There's the thirty thousand dollar grants for helping to get plans done, and then once you get a plan done, you can ask for the seventy-five to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the reason for doing the plan is you've identified a couple of areas that might be problem. Maybe you want to get an aerator to take the both and water back and forth. Maybe you want to put bentham covers down where the water chestnuts are, and milk oil is down the very southern part where the, where the outfall is. Maybe we want to do an alum treatment, especially near the town beach, to clear up the water quality so people are more comfortable. Is that the right way? I may have the right thing. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, since you're not, you don't have your back against the wall right now, you have the, if you have the ability to pull together a plan, looking long term, you'll be in a really great position. Put yourself in a great position to avoid having problems down the road that are going to cost you a lot more to fix. Um, and to be able to get funding to address those things proactively. So, yes, I would. I would strongly recommend that that be <laughs> a next step. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't do some of the major stuff that you guys are continuing to do. I, I definitely would recommend just letting the plans take over the lake. But town, town meeting is pretty comfortable paying about five thousand a year for the water treatments. So the question is, especially given budgets, we probably wouldn't be able to ask for too much more. But we can talk about getting some CPA money. For this initial grant, there may be other avenues that you can look into to get at that first plan written that would enable us to identify, okay, in the next three years, do we do aeration? Do we do how long are we going to prioritize? And that's what, that's what the plan is. Yeah, that's what the plan is. Yeah, the priority and what we tend to achieve. I would think. Priority is to keep a healthy lake. The main reason to have a healthy lake, Lake Nippon, is for recreation and use. We're not looking to start a fish farm. No, we're not we're using not. this amount of Right, so it would be a uh, recreation and use. So our priority would be to make sure we have clean, safe water that children and people can put their feet in. That's, that's a basic, it's a basic cut off. So I'm not sure who's yeah. going to take the lead. I guess I'd look to Lake Nymphon, maybe not fair, but look to the association to keep CONCOM engaged as well as the Board of Health. And so I don't know who else we can... Well, I think it's the, the park department. The park number yeah, one. That's, like I said, my personal opinion is Lake Nipmuc is our greatest natural resource. Why? For recreation. We're not looking to drink it. We're not looking to start a fish farm or any type of commercial endeavor. And it's more than just the people who live there. Right? It's right. It's for number one for a long time. 
So if people have lived there, as you can see, uh, actively, actively trying to get everybody on board. Right. We're going to just report, and I just don't want it to sit and go to next year and we'll come go to the budget and decide to spend some more money for oversize when I don't know how we keep the ball going. I can tell you parks is going to be focusing right now on the physical beach. Um the, the site that whatnot. You know, so I, I think I know Anna got involved, but I like you said, I think you know I don't know what the mechanism is mechanism is if we get up go to reform some sort of a committee with people from each group. To, to come up with a plan regarding well, I think it's a lot easier to tap CPC money, which probably is for recreation, which is going to be maybe an environmental. That's why I'm trying to look at the bank. Well, I'm sure, it all ties in together, and then maybe get some MVP money or if it makes sense. Yeah, I think the first step is to look in our CP community preservation fund to see if that will help. How much of that can we create this initial plan? Once we get a, a full blown plan in place. That we can, as you said, go for the really larger grants to improve the, the quality of the money. I, I think going for the for the grants is an excellent one. And a lot of again show sort of talent, show a good faith effort. We have to take some of our own money, i.e. CPA money. More than once the association has in mind. So when we all of that should be incorporated for where we're going to go after the grants, so I like the fact that, hey, we're looking to do a big project here. Lake, come up the town's been kicking in, a private organization been kicking in. Now, now we go after some grants. But priori priority is for recreation, and we're going to prioritize what, just what the problem is. Can I say recreation is one thing, but I moved to the lake for the natural beauty and for the wildlife, and I don't want that to be so well, lost. Is that recreation? Well, I don't know what you mean by recreation. recreation. Yeah. I, I'm not looking to put a Ferris wheel up there. <laughs> that that was a hundred years ago. But to deny people to come and look at the beauty of the lake that you just described is the whole idea we're doing. It. Otherwise, if somebody wants to just keep it for their own personal use, then why are we getting involved? Right. But I don't believe the whole reason why people are involved is to keep it for their own use. Multiple uses for sure. Have we done it? Are we going to do it, Jared? One, one last thing. I think an, an action that we can take immediately is when we are speaking with the people who will be treating the lake next year, we can say, so how much sampling can you incorporate while you're doing that? Since it does seem like the lake is a large part. Is the report going to be uh, accessible to the public? I would think if it's electronic, or you don't yeah, we'll it. post it. At some point, we're going to have a new beach website, but the current preliminary study is on the website. This meeting was recorded and will get posted. And once we have the final report, we'll post it. Once it's once, once it's submitted to us, it becomes a public document. And what yeah. Dan is saying, we'll make it available. Today's modern technology. Do you submit uh, paper copies? Uh, it's, I think we only had electronic in the folder. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it goes to the library. We can get print ones. But electronically, whose website should it be on? The town or the concom or the. Yeah, we'll, we'll link it. Link it everywhere. What the heck? I'm sure it'll get sent out through Lake Nitmuck and we'll be sure to publicize it as soon as it's available. You know? Um, yeah. So I think, and then I think if people. Can read through it. That would help. Not to feel the more interested. Yeah, there's one in October. Involved with this. Yes, I, after I read the report, I'll see you not talking to the newspaper. The town of Brighton will see you. Get an article out of it. Or if the reporter wants to write something up about the report, point people to it. 
starting to hold community awareness and you want to call it by. And this PowerPoint might be available as well. Yeah, it's, it's yours now, though. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you want to send that to me, and we'll have the recording from tonight. And then... Yeah, I think I sent you a link to oh, download it. Okay. It's kind of a big file, so. That's fine. Yeah, I didn't. Uh... Yeah, and you have the PDF as well. So oh, I see. Whatever is best for you for posting. Well, thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Are you? I think we're ready to adjourn. Yeah. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. So move. Amen. Thank you very much.